Section 13 of The Thrill Book, Volume 1, Number 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by LibVox53. The Thrill Book, Volume 1, Number 6. Magic in Manhattan by Robert W. Snedden. Part 2. Next morning I was taking a stroll with Ram, when to my dismay I saw Professor Veda approaching me. I am no coward, but I seek the violet paths of non-resistance, and, seeing a door on my right hand, I pushed in, dragging Ram with me. I was just in time to see the professor walk past, counting loudly to himself. I realized he was keeping himself awake after a seance of some sort. "'Why, Pert, old man, come over here,' bellowed a great voice. I leaped into the air. "'My Lord Tilby, what a start you gave me,' I ejaculated. "'Have a drink, Foglestone. Looking about me, I was pained to find I was in a saloon. "'How are you, Tilby?' I inquired, recovering my composure. Really, it was annoying to run into him, and in a saloon, and so early in the forenoon. "'Great, my boy, great.' George set up another one. I sighed. Half a cigar, I said, drawing out my case. To my surprise, there was none there. Have one of mine. I get em from a customer. Market Gardener. Says there's nothing like em imported from Havana. I can well believe that, I said sadly. I knew them of old. Say, Foglestone, surely you don't mean to say you don't like em, he protested. My dear Tilby, when a cigar is strong, it's like the truth. It prevails, but thanks all the same. Oh, all right, but thunder. A new dog, my lord. You like him, eh? Um, what about the mastiff, he continued without mercy. Tilby, I commenced, you surely must have heard of the dog exchange. He repeated the last words in a dazed fashion. Yes, the dog exchange, I continued firmly. Surely you, of all persons, a dog expert, a close student of canine psychology. Tilby blushed. Oh, come off it, old man, he said noisily. Well, anyway, it is an institution run by a dear old lady with kind heart and a silver-white hair. I mean a kind heart. Oh, you know what I mean, which takes care of dogs temporarily sick. When you put your dog in, you go to the exchange department with your ticket. You get a ticket, eh? Surely, a ticket. Please give bearer a terrier, or whatever species you fancy, in exchange for Fido, number so-and-so. You pick out your dog, and so your family is consoled till your own dog is better, see? And then you exchange again. Fine idea, but you had a mastiff last time. The supply of bulldogs had run out, I assured him solemnly. He gazed at me in prolonged silence, then he smacked me painfully on the knee. I say, he trumpeted, I've got it. I never saw a bulldog like that. You're going to show that dog at the dog show. Opens Wednesday. I know the secretary, personal friend, so drink up and we'll go see him right away. Before I could register a protest, I was swept out in the swirl of Tilby's personality, and we were dashing madly up the street. I was dragged into an elevator, into an office, and I heard myself being introduced to Mr. Pinkleton, secretary of the Kennel Club, as Pert Fogleston, the funny writer. Mr. Pinkleton laughed uneasily and said, Pleased, uh, to meet you, uh. From the tone of his voice, I knew he had never heard of me. He probably would have been less cordial had he done so. Now, Pinkleton, said Tilby, you know a good dog. Look this one over. Pinkleton coughed. Ah, uh, um, very fine. Want to show him? Certainly has points. I told you, Foglestone. I know there was some class to him. Some class, Pinkleton murmured. Why, of course. Bulldogs, open, forty-five pounds and over. Certainly there is a class for him. Tilby gazed at him open-mouthed for the first time in his life-stricken dumb. Your name and address, Mr. Foglestone, Pinkleston demanded. 
Pertinax Foglestone, 45 New Grub Street. And the dog's name? Ram, er, same address. Pinkleton sat up, disapproval written all over his pink face. But surely, my dear Foglestone, you don't call a bulldog Ram, most unheard of. Why not Brooklyn Billy or Newport Beauty? Surely not Ram. Ram, I said firmly, because... He butts in, guffawed Tilby. Pinkleton sighed and wrote down the name. Oh, by the by, his pedigree. Out of Hindu by Mystic, I said shortly, taking the first thing that came to my mind. Pinkleton dried the ink, shook my hand, and we came out. I said goodbye to Tilby and walked on, and then a devilish whim overtook me. Why not enter another dog? Why not? Before I could restrain myself, I was back in Pinkleton's office. Oh, Mr. Pinkleton, I said breathlessly, I want to enter another dog. Really, you have two? What sort of dog? I hesitated. What classes have you? I asked finally. Mr. Foglestone, said Pinkleton severely, let me give you a catalog. If you have anything out of the ordinary, we can no doubt accommodate it. Ah, oh, well, as a matter of fact, I murmured, looking over the list. It is a, a Great Dane. Male or female, solid or brindle. Male, solid. Name, Ram. It was the only name I could think of. Pingleton laid down his pen, stared at me, then took it up and carefully inscribed the name without a word. Goodbye and good luck, he said after a pause. Thank you, I answered meekly. By the by, asked my wife when I got home an hour late for lunch, where have you been? Mary, I said impressively. Hone soi. I have had a busy morning. I met Tilby. Ah, was all her comment, but it was as comprehensive as the Encyclopedia Britannica. I escaped from the house the morning of the dog show, but only at the expense of the truth, and here I may set down one profound reflection. You cannot twist the tail of the truth without getting a good bite from the other end. I pleaded an all-day business engagement and fled. Why on earth didn't I tell Mary? I don't know. I was doing nothing wrong in showing Ram, improving the breed and all that sort of thing. I passed into the show without comment. A hard-faced gentleman in a blue jersey welcomed me in the gallery. Name, he shot at me. Pertinax Foglestone. I could see that the name made a profound impression. I almost felt impressed myself. All right, chain him up here, he said grudgingly. I chained Ram in his compartment and wandered downstairs. What a bunch of dogs, large and small, male and female, human, gay dogs in riding breeches and ladies in sporting tweeds. A medley of yelping, whining, barking, a babble of talk and laughter, a pungent smell of sawdust and dog soap. Pingleton, in an astounding suit of checks, darted past me. Hello, Poglestick, he said brightly. Splendid weather. Good morning, Twinkletoes, I retorted courteously. Poglestick, indeed. The judging began, an old lady with a pleasant face took her place in the ring, accompanied by a stout man in horsey clothes chewing a cigar butt. The dogs were led in. There was lifting up of heads, examining of ears, mouth, back, tail, and a general poking in the ribs by the judges. A little whispering, and then presentation of the coveted blue and red ribbons. Suddenly Bulldogs was put up on the board, and I scurried off. I had just released Ram when I met the persistent stranger. Fine dog, he said breezily. You are right, I assented, and took a good look at him. His round red face emerged from a very tight collar, and he wore a suit of distinctive checks. I would have set him down as an actor had he not worn a heavy black mustache and a couple of real diamond rings. Don't want to sell, he continued, walking by my side. No. All right, see you later, he said good-humoredly, as he left me. I felt flustered as I led Ram into the ring. There was an approving murmur. We owners solemnly pranced around with our dogs. 
my heart leaped as the lady pointed to ram and i led him on to the platform i heard a murmur of low thick-set well-sprung ribs flat skull under jaw long broad well turned up rose-colored ears high on skull good color weight forty-six pounds that will do said the stout man take him over there i led ram down and turned to watch the other entries all at once i was startled by a gradually increasing chorus of oh the dear isn't he clever i looked down at ram he was sitting upright on his hind legs leaning against a post his forepaws folded across his broad chest in human fashion one eye half closed i felt a cold perspiration trickle down my spine what next my heavens what next luckily the judge saved the situation he thrust something into my hand the blue ribbon told you so said a voice in my ear intelligent ain't the word for that animal it was the stranger who walked back with me to the gallery now that dog might be a trick dog he continued he might there's no saying i answered cautiously never saw his equal sitting up like a human being there's a future for that dog I wouldn't part with him, I assured him. Not for, for five hundred dollars, eh? Ram gave a growl. Five thousand, I concluded softly. The stranger coughed, then caught my arm excitedly. Look at that! I felt the blood rush to my head. Incredible as it may seem, there was the dog holding the ribbon against his breast with one paw and smiling as near as a dog can smile. I've seen dogs in my day, but this and he mopped his brow. Pooh, I said airily, recovering my composure. He can do everything but talk, and now you must excuse me. All right, I have something to propose to you when you have time, and he moved away. I looked about to see that I was alone, and led Ram into a corner. He shivered as if he knew what was coming. I murmured my spell, and I was horrified to see him change so slowly that for a moment he was half bulldog and half great dane at last there stood a magnificent dog and as i turned to go down with him i recoiled the stranger stood by with bulging eyes his lips moved nervously and he was waving his hands in the air i put my finger on my lips and passed him it was the same over again ram lifted the blue ribbon and with beating heart i led him up to the gallery again as i reached the head of the stairs the attendant rushed to meet me hi mister somebody's pinched your dog why i have him right here i exclaimed the bull mister this'll cost me my job a policeman moved over anything wrong he asked gent's dog pinched that's what it is said the attendant savagely some guy sneaked in when my back was turned the policeman drew out a large notebook. I was in a hole, and I knew it. The fact that the stranger had appeared on the scene and was regarding me with an enigmatic smile did not add to my comfort. You don't blame me, the attendant said piteously. A sob rose in my throat. Perhaps he had a family. No, no, my good fellow, I said, pressing his hand. No, it's no fault of yours. The dog's gone but you're not to blame. Leave me alone for a little, all of you, and let me think it out. The attendant sniffed and moved away. The policeman stared at me suspiciously. When you want me, let me know. It's my opinion there's something wrong here, he said righteously and tramped away. Go on, my friend, said the stranger lightly. Treat me as a confidant and let me see some more hanky-panky. I blinked at him forlornly. I saw that I was in his power. Oh, it's all right, he whispered. Close as death. Go ahead. Say your, hey presto, though how you work it beats me. Not a word, then, I breathed finally and concentrating my attention, turned Ram back into his bulldog form. The attendant soldered back then, his mouth gaped. My God, he gasped. Here's your blamed dog, but where's the other one? I looked at him blankly. What other one? The attendant clutched at the empty air for support. He thrust his face forward to the stranger's appealingly. "'What other one?' echoed the stranger composedly. The attendant shrank away. 
here, here. What, what? A little optical illusion, my new friend said suavely, pressing some money into the attendant's hand and winking at me. Have you never heard of the wonderful and astounding Hindu illusionist and wonder worker, uh, Prince Chota Lai, to be seen next week at the Broadway Vaudeville Palace? Look in one night and ask for Mr. Albert Evans. There will be a seat for you and your lady. The attendant shoved the bill into his pocket. All right, if it's only a bit of conjuring, but you sure gave me a turn. Now I've got to look after my business. Thank ye. Mr. Evans and I looked at each other in silence, as if measuring up our respective willpower. Mr. Foglestone, he said at last, you heard what I said. I mean every word of it. Five hundred a week. The best billing in town. Costumes and setting provided for the trick. I don't ask you how it's done, but it's the swellest delusion I've ever seen. We'll stand em up next week. Now how about it? I endeavored to speak, but his compelling eye held me dumb. I thought hard. I needed the money. Lord, what writer doesn't? Just put your name here, he said, handing me a paper and a fountain pen. I signed my name with a sigh. Rehearse Monday morning. Just change the dog inside of the audience. That's all I ask, and we'll pad out the act all right. See you Monday morning, sure? Sure, I said dolefully, shaking hands with him. Why, Pert? I jumped. It was Mary. I gasped out a jumble of explanation, shoved the blue ribbons into her hand, and they saved the situation. They won my pardon. Luckily, she did not ask how I came to have two. Who was your friend? she asked curiously. Oh, a chance acquaintance, I mumbled, and dragged her past the attendant, who was about to speak. You do make the queerest friends, she said, linking her arm in mine, and we passed safely out of the show. My only consolation was that Tilby did not come. I repented my agreement every second the next four days. I could not walk a yard, but a flaring sheet would greet my eyes on bill stations, house walls, store windows, and garbage cans proclaiming the appearance of Chota Lai, prince of Hindu illusionists and master of the marvels of the East. I shuddered as I regarded the swarthy Hindu staring out of them. Mr. Evans was sparing no expense. Even Mary noticed the confounded things. What a horrible, evil face, she commented as we strolled along Broadway. Ah, oh, oh, the Hindu? Probably came from Brooklyn, you never know. Marvels of the East, that should interest you. Why in the name of goodness, Mary? I asked nervously. Why should it? I found a little book behind the bookcase yesterday. Must have slipped down. Magic of the East. Oh, that, an article, reference, you know. I wonder if we couldn't go one night, she suggested. Mary, I said sternly, I am surprised at you. You pain me. A knockabout show? I think we might have some afternoon tea, eh? What do you say? And I dragged her into a tea room. It is the only method of diverting a woman on the trail of a mystery. Sunday passed away. I came near to doing the same myself. If ever there was a contempt in manifest form, it showed in Ram's face. In addition, he chewed the covers off Magic of the East. When I got to the Vaudeville Palace with Ram on Monday morning, it was only after prolonged search that the stage manager could be found, and I was allowed on the stage. Now, Mr. Choda, he said, Mr. Evans is going to rehearse your act. He's going to give you a swell set, and you're going to dress in number one. Is the dog in the act? The dog is the act, I assured him feebly. Dog act. Say, you've got your nerve. But the boss has the say here. Got your props, would ye? My props? Er, what are props? He glared at me. Say, oh, what's the use? Boxes? Basket? What do you work with? Oh, I haven't any baggage, no. All right, you know best and he left me in charge of a stagehand who led me to the dressing room. It took me quite a while to get into the costume I found there. Ram sniffed at the garments and let out a long, blood-curdling howl, and I had a weird fancy that I heard a soft whisper of remember. 
but there was not a soul in the room. I walked out onto the stage and felt my hand shaken. How do, Prince? said Mr. Evans breezily. And the pup? Costume's great, and when we make you up, your own mother would never know you. Thank heaven for that, I said fervently. What do you think of the billing? I knew what was expected. Great, immense. Mr. Evans slapped me on the back. That a boy. Thought you'd be pleased. Now what do you think of that for a set? I gazed around. The stage was set with an Indian temple, a solid massive structure with heavy pillars, leading down from which was a flight of steps, flanked by braziers burning blue flame. At the back a river scene with rippling moonlight. The rest of the stage was masked in with jungle and trees. Swell, ain't it? purred Mr. Evans proudly. Picked it up from an opera show that went to pieces. I've got two tom-tom men and some creepy music. We're fairly going to make them sit up. Now, Bill, make them tigers roar. I shrank back as a horrid roaring made the scenery vibrate. Couple of men blowing down lamp chimneys, Evans commented calmly. Where's them tom-toms? Two men dressed as Hindus advanced slowly out of the temple beating tom-toms, circled the stage and squatted down. Now you come on through the temple door. Say you don't want to bring the dog on. Can't you hocus-pocus him out of the air like... I'll try, I said, resigned to my fate. That's the stuff. I guess you hypnotize the folks. However, that's your biz. Now get off. All right, tom-toms. Oh, toots, give us the overture. Tom-toms, wait the cue. Now, professor. Now, tom-toms, slower. Round again, three bars. Now, prince. Half a second I called, and casting a despairing glance at Ram, I made him vanish. As I did so, a tall Hindu grazed my shoulder. I turned and looked at him. His face was ablaze with rage. I beg your pardon, I faltered. Come on, Prince, what's keeping you? bellowed Evans. Another supper, I thought, and walked on. Play that last bar again. That's your cue, Prince. Now some arm waving. Give him the real stuff. I clenched my teeth. After all, it was a joke, and I salaamed and bowed and what not for a bit. That's the idea. Now downstage to me. Keep it up, Tom Toms. Now stop. Stand there. Now, say, where's the poodle? In the box. Holy. Oh, all right. Hi there. A spotlight on this here box. Now, toots. Creepy. Curdle their blood. Now, prince, when I ring the chimes here, temple bells, you know, let her go. Mutter a bit. Bow. Say, them lamps flare when you bow. Remember that, Joe. Flare em when the prince bows. Now ready all, chimes, ting-tong. There was a discordant clash of bells. Mr. Evans jumped. Say, who the blazes is monkeying with them chimes? Nobody answered. I mumbled my spell softly and ram shot full into view in the spotlight. Gee, what do you know about that, said the stage manager hoarsely. Mr. Evans slapped him on the back. Wait a bit, George, we ain't through. How's that? I asked anxiously. Splendid, my boy. Oh, by the by, Mr. Evans, where does the other Hindu come on? I asked. There ain't no other. Why, there was one outside at the temple entrance when I came on. Mr. Evans emitted a volley of oaths. By thunder, spying the act, is he? Hunt him out, boys. Scatter and get him. But the Hindu was not to be found. Well, he can't do us no harm, said Evans, recovering his cheerfulness. Now what next, Prince? I thought hard. Suppose I... Stand on your head, Ram. Now revolve. Ram spun around on his nose, his tail erect. My lord, Mr. Evans chuckled. We'll pack him in. Tell Brink no free list. Mr. F., I can promise you five weeks here, the circuit and return. Thank you, I said meekly. Try his other end, suggested George suddenly. 
Spin on your tail, Ram, I commanded. And there was witnessed the extraordinary spectacle of a full-grown bulldog spinning like fury on the point of his rigid tail. Stop him, he'll set the blamed place afire, cried Mr. Evans at last, and indeed the wood of the stage was smoking. I stopped him and Ram stood erect on his tail. I was full of confidence now that I could make him perform any improbable trick I wanted. Right, bring him down. Makes me feel queer to see the hound up there. Now you're on at 9.15. Be here around 8 o'clock and keep cool. And say, keep clear of them Hindus. As I was undressing, the door opened and George poked his head in. Say, Prince, how do you work it? I smiled bitterly and shook my head. Some guys is too wise to live, he said, and slammed the door. Luckily, Mary was out and had left word I was to join her at Tilby's for dinner. I put that out of my mind and spent the most unhappy afternoon of my life in fearful anticipation. About six, I stole out and ate miserably by myself and smoked till it was time to go to the theater. To my surprise, George was excessively amiable. Say, Prince, what do you think? he greeted me with. Box office says thirty of them spook bugs. A cult society is coming tonight. Evans mailed em tickets, and by jings, they're all coming. You'll have to be pretty wise to put it over that bunch, added George with a malevolent grin as he turned away. I sat in my dressing room shaking all over when Evans bustled in with a man. Mr. Peruk chowed a lie. This is the gent. Give him a good makeup, not too dark. How do you feel, Prince? Rotten, I answered sadly. Evans dashed out and came back with a champagne bottle and a tumbler. Here's how. Swallow that. That's better, eh? Yeah, yes, I answered with chattering teeth. Yes, I wonder if I might have a drop more. Sure. Now you're as brave as a lion. Biggest house we've had this year. Now get busy, Peruke. The man dashed at me, smeared my face, lined my eyes and lips, drew a wig over my hair, stuck a turban on it, and when I hung the glass chains of rubies around my neck, I looked into the mirror. I was safe from recognition. Evans hauled me on the stage. The hands were building up the scene. In front of the drop, someone was singing. Those lights, blue-green, say, put a bunch light in the corner. Try that ripple. Lower on that short, boy. Now, is them heavy iron braces behind the pillars? Right. Tom-Tom's there. Now clear stage. Quick. The orchestra commenced the overture, and the drop rose. I could hear a ripple of admiration run over the house, and the set got a good hand. Evans motioned. The tigers roared. The two Tom-Tom men stepped through the temple door, did their march round, and squatted down stage. Now, whispered Evans quietly, take your time, feel em out, and do your very best, old man. I stepped out on the temple steps and did my salaaming. The audience was very still. Some unknown power seemed to be guiding me, and I had no fear. Coming down stage, I laid the box on the floor cloth. The spotlight sprang to it. I waved my arms, muttered my spell imperiously and Ram appeared as the chimes sounded at the back. There was a moment of intense silence, followed by a buzz, then frantic applause. I raised my hands over my head as if invoking aid, then I held up my right hand for silence. It fell on the house instantly. Slowly I circled my palms over Ram and murmured, Rise in the air, Ram, and pass round my head. Ram rose into the air as if standing on something, and made a circle round my head. Then I gasped as he floated out over the orchestra, high in the air, described a curve, and returned to me. I could hear him panting and grinding his teeth, and I shrank back as he descended to the stage. Someone said, It's a trick, and there was a riot as he was ejected. I spun Ram on his head and tail, and the house grew more and more excited. 
I had only one more trick to do, to change Ram into a larger dog. It was then that I felt my first symptoms of fear. I felt my willpower weaken, but I knew I had to go through with it, and I went up stage and leaned against a temple pillar. There seemed to be a jangle of bells, and I felt a wave of cold air strike my face. Summoning all my strength, I stretched out my hands, fixed my mind on the image of a mastiff, and pronounced the fatal words. As I did so, a voice said distinctively, Fool, the third time. I was conscious of a tall Hindu towering over me, gazing into my eyes with fierce enmity. There was a loud crash, a discordant peal of bells, and everything seemed to fade from me. I was falling dizzily, dizzily. When I came to, I was in the dressing room. Evans was standing by me, waving a towel. My forehead was wringing wet with ice water. Well, boy, he cried eagerly as I focused my eyes on his red, perturbed face. You certainly gave us a fright. I moaned dismally. It was that damned Hindu, I explained feebly. What Hindu? There was a Hindu did something to me, I insisted. Nonsense, my boy, there was no Hindu there. I saw you fall flat, and I rung down. But I knew I had not been mistaken. I had tampered with something that there was no use explaining. What a fool I had been. The door of the unseen had been mine to open, and I had thrown away my chance. Search revealed no trace of Ram or the mysterious box. They who must not be disobeyed had seen to that, and I had made my last incursion into the occult. End of section 13、section、14 14 of the Thrill Book, Volume 1, Number 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Eli Quill. The Thrill Book, Volume 1, Number 6. Marsa, by Harold Hersey as Charles Buxton. You came to me laden with gifts, my sweet. The giving was good, so clean a thing, that even I found virgin songs to sing. That were not echoes of some dead defeat. Few loves there are that find us armed to meet. The wasted spirits roused desiring. Vain, vain were all the gifts that you might bring, save love with her own hands performed the feat. Ah, lay your cool white fingers at my face, that I might touch the love that stirs me so. Hand in hand, then, let us fly through space. Look back on earth where people come and go. Remembering that we come of that same race, yet have created worlds they cannot know. End of section 14 Section 15 of The Thrill Book, Volume 1, Number 6 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Eli Quill. The Thrill Book, Volume 1, Number 6. Out of Our Hands Reach, by Harold Hersey as Roy Lemoyne. Age gives us back the unseen things of night, the gray, discarded litter of our days, and dead loves buried in the hidden ways, rise up to mock us robed in deathless white. Blind eyes see through the darkness into light, while all things youth's hungry heart obeys, become like some immortal poet's lays, out of our hands reach, yet within the sight. Today a child runs to its father's knee, a lover goes unto his love's embrace, a vessel surges through the restless sea, a hare flees trembling in a hunting chase. Then, like a flash, comes down the enemy, who steals the dreams that light each living face. End of section 15 Section 16 of The Thrill Book, Volume 1, Number 6 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Thrill Book, Volume 1, Number 6, When Brasset Forgot, by Harcourt Farmer. 1. I had always regarded Brasset as a curious kind of human duck, a strange mixture of somnolence and brain, but it wasn't until his death that I really believed him a trifle mad. The newspapers at the time chronicled the passing of Professor Henry Laterman Brasset, with the usual accompanying stuff from their morgues, an ample tribute was paid to his splendid research work in the Congo. He was tireless and energetic and original. He labored in many fields. In fact, to this man the world owes the famous Brasset rubber compound for tires, a preparation that has saved the United States government thousands of dollars in equipment maintenance. And when he died, there was much sincere sorrow in the scientific world. The medical certificate stated that death was from natural causes. The press agreed with the doctors, the public believed what they were told, and so the world knew nothing to the contrary. But there were two men who were in a position to prove at the time that the professor's death was distinctly unnatural. One was Taylor, who will be remembered as the brilliant editor of The Meteor. The other is myself. For ten years, a strict silence has been kept by us about the truth of the Brasset tragedy. But I think, and Taylor thinks with me, that the time has come to present the facts. It may possibly do some ethical good. And now that Brasset has become almost a myth, no harm can result from lifting the curtain. I am writing of events that took place in the fall of 1906. We had been dining together, Brasset and Taylor and I, and I was in particularly fine fettle, owing to the unexpected acceptance of a set of articles I had ground out on India. In addition, Taylor had commissioned me, I was the gayest of freelances in those days, to write up some special matter on rubber, which commodity was then all the rage. Hence this dinner with Brasset. During the dessert, the talk ranged over a dozen varied topics, and later on, I recalled the circumstances which led to becoming acquainted with the professor. I first met Brasset at Nice, when he was on the eve of being swindled in a particularly complete style by the fascinating Nellie Forsyth, and I had the satisfaction of spoiling little Nellie's pretty game once and for all. Brasset seemed profoundly grateful about this, though it wasn't really much to bother over, and thereafter, we were good friends. Nellie, by the way, but that's another tale. The next time I ran across the academic chappie was in London, at the Albert Hall, where I was covering the annual meeting of the Royal Geographical Society. This was some three years after the Nice episode. The professor was wont to say, in his dry way, after the Nice un -Nice episode, and I must confess I had partially forgotten all about Nellie. But the thin metallic tones snapping from the platform brought back a good deal. His address was quite the most interesting event in a most uninteresting program, and he told his audience, which was composed of six parts professor and two parts nondescript and the press, a few things concerning rubber, its preparations, its values, its uses, where it comes from, and what is done with it, and talked so learnedly that we all felt quite expert on the subject as a consequence. You are the gentleman I met at Nice, he said, when I went up to him at the conclusion of the meeting. Under, well, rather distressing circumstances, am I right? I told him he was, and congratulated him on his excellent memory. Well, on this particular night, when we were at dinner at the Savoy, over our cigars, Professor Brassett suddenly switched the current of conversation from Lloyd George to spiders, and on this peculiar topic, he waxed discursive. He said he had been devoted to spiders all his life. They give me more delight than perhaps you imagine. We stared. He rambled out about African spiders and English domestic spiders and spiders from the Andalusian fastnesses. He told us about spiders that feed on small sparrows and spiders that will eat man's flesh if they can get it. I have seen spiders, he said, that would, but possibly you gentlemen, would be sufficiently interested in our subject matter to see some rather curious specimens. 
I should, Taylor replied, and when I nodded confirmation, the professor capped it by rising and leading the way to the street, where a taxi transferred us, in fairly adequate style, to the Brasset flat. Brasset was accounted eccentric because he had an aversion to entertaining. To my knowledge, he rarely invited a man to his apartments, though he was generally eager to dine a chap at the club or accept the hospitality of others. He lived with a manservant, and as he laboriously opened the door, he explained with much prolixity that the man was away for two weeks. No wife by my own choice, and no man by his, he chuckled. We soon made ourselves at home. He had some drinkable whiskey and some ripping cigars, and we talked and smoked and drank for a couple of hours. And while Taylor and Brassett argued some dull point about another professor's book, I found myself wondering why Brassett had made the concrete rule of not inviting people to see him, except on state occasions. The explanation turned up a few minutes later. Would you care to see my spiders now? The professor inquired politely, and, without waiting for a reply, led us to a door of a room at the other end of the apartment. The door was painted a dull brown, almost a russet brown, and nailed along the bottom of the door were some thick, even pieces of felt. In addition to a Yale lock, it was fastened with two strong padlocks, caught between staples. While the old fellow was bending over his series of locks, bolts, and bars, I glanced at Taylor, and he at me, quizzically. Soon the padlocks were off, and then Brassett turned the key in the main lock, and as he did so, he called out something in an unknown tongue. I think it was Arabic, but that's only a weird guess on my part. Anyway, it was as though the sound of his voice had unlocked something in the room, concurrently with the unlocking of the door by his key, for no sooner had he shouted than we heard a sudden and strange noise inside. I can best describe that noise by saying that it seemed like the tapping on the floor of a thousand dead men's fingertips. I had never heard anything quite like it. Said Brasset, I must warn you both that on no account must you speak while in the room. If you do, I cannot be held responsible. So long as you are quiet, all will be well. Come! He pushed open the door and entered, and we after him. Then he closed the door carefully and quickly behind us. The primary and dominant impression was that we had, by some quixotic mishap, strayed into an undertaker's embalming room after a big railroad accident. I felt disgustingly sick. The stench was awful. But in a few seconds, the nausea fell away from me. Taylor, who was never what you would call robust, seemed inclined to faint, for he turned deathly pale, but with an effort pulled himself together too. Brasset alone was unmoved. Freely, with the unautomatic certainty of a man who feels wholly familiar with his surroundings, he moved into the room, saying something in his gunmetal tones, and the cluttering, rasping, padding noise increased. We stood rock-like, while Brasset went right across the room, still keeping up his weird chant, his hands outstretched towards some object. What it was we could not see, for the room was dark. Suddenly, he stopped. Shrill and sharp, the chant pierced the air, and a funny feeling began to tingle in my hands. I don't know if it was fear, I don't know whether Taylor was feeling the same, but I do know that we kept a rigid silence, remembering Brasset's injunction. The silly song rose into a minor strain. We heard Brasset clap his hands together very softly, and then a light blazed. I say blazed because it seemed like a blast of yellow flame in that warm black room. In reality, it was an electric bulb, shrouded carefully with dull brownish paper. So the room appeared as obscure as the professor's native melody. But what light there was was amply sufficient. Brasset knelt on the floor, singing his damned Arabic or whatever it was, and on his hands, his knees, his shoulders, all over the floor, on the walls, on the ceiling, in thick nests, in ones and twos and clusters and dozens, were spiders. No normal man objects to seeing a spider once in a while under ordinary conditions, or even a couple of them. But I have to confess that the sight of a university professor in a dress suit, who had come straight from a respectable dinner at the Savoy, almost smothered by countless spiders, sickened me. 
The things padded about the floor, ran up and down Brassett's legs, pulled their way through his hair, walked across his face, hid in his beard, sat on his nose, crawled in and out of his ears, and generally nested on him. The creatures who could not get near him he picked up by the handful, while they appeared to register content, as the saying goes. It may have been genuine affection on their part, and genuine regard on Brassett's part. God preserve me from such affection. The chant went on unremittingly, and then Brassett rose, shaking himself free from his ugly pets, and held out something indistinct in his right hand. We looked closely and saw that it was a little dead mouse. Taylor's breath came and went in quivering gasps, which he tried to stifle. The professor rapped out a long and twisted phrase in the jargon which the spiders seemed to understand, and they ran up his body in masses and along the outstretched arm, toward the mouse. I tried to count them, but my brain refused to work. At the lowest computation, there must have been a thousand spiders on the man, and there were others in the room. They reached the mouse. Brassett's hand was hidden behind a palpitating, seething cloud of dark bodies and countless legs. One or two bright red legs here and there. Two or three of the spiders uttered faint sighs, and we heard the mouse eaten. That was the last straw for Taylor, for he turned abruptly and said in very healthy and unmistakable English, Good God, let's get out of this, and stumbled to the door. Instantly there was a silence, and you could literally feel it. The spiders suspended their meal and appeared to listen. Brassett jerked under his breath, quick, and we both made for the door. Brassett followed us. He shut and locked the door, and from within we could hear them at the door, for all the world like thousands of clay pellets being thrown at the brown panels. They were trying to get through. It is unsafe to speak in there, said Brassett, as we walked to the living room for a stiff drink. They become exceedingly fierce if you say anything to them, unless one uses the particular dialect I employ. Which is, I questioned, but Brassett was lost in thought. Two. A few weeks later, I wanted to ask the professor about a point in rubber, and one morning I rang the bell at his apartment. I rang it six times, as a matter of fact, without response. There was no sign of either professor or valet. I telephoned Taylor at the paper, and told him he had better meet me at Brassett's flat. While I was waiting, I hunted up the janitor of the building. But he proved as stupid as the race of men foreordained to be janitors, and all he had to say was that the valet, only he termed it valet, had not returned, and he knew nothing of the professor. Taylor came presently, and after talking over the situation, we decided to risk interference and get into the apartment. We allayed the janitor with a durable piece of fiction, to the effect that we wanted to see the place with a view to renting it, and a tip evoked a duplicate key. We succeeded in ridding ourselves of him for the time being, and entered. Perhaps it was ominous, but we both turned instinctively toward the room with a dull brown door. I called Brassett, and as the noise of my shout died away, we heard the familiar cluttering, padding sound from inside. Brassett, there was no response. Brassett, he's in there, I said to Taylor, and cursed myself for saying it, for something told me I wasn't far wrong. Taylor nodded. Burst the door in, he said. I thought to show how absurd his remark was by pointing at the padlocks, when I realized the padlocks were off. I tried the handle of the door. The door was unlocked. After that, it was just a matter of simple discovery. The professor's body lay on the floor, and the yellow light, which had evidently been on for some days, showed the state of things in their hideous completeness. What had once been flesh was now a chaos of spiders. The clothes hung in patches and threads about the bones, and only a minute piece of skin remained. Along the floor, toward us, the intruders, sidled hundreds of spiders, some fat and bloated, some thin, but all bent on the one objective. We banged the door to and went out into the sunshine. End of section 16 Read by Marissa D. Six, Clearwater, Florida, March 9th, 2024.
Section 17 of The Thrill Book, Volume 1, Number 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Christine Rucker. The Thrill Book, Volume 1, Number 6. Milady's Will, a Satire by James Waldo Fawcett. Everyone admired Milady's hands. They were wondrously fascinating, long and slender and white, rose-tipped, so perfectly modelled. Milady's lover grew tired at last and departed in search of new adventure. Milady mourned his loss a thousand days, hoping always that he would return. He did not forget Milady quite the contrary. Wherever he went, he told of her beauty. Such hands she has, he would rapturously exclaim. Such beautiful hands! And then he would describe their fine qualities in detail. After many days, it happened that one of those to whom Milady's lover spoke returned to the city where Milady lived, and on the appropriate occasion presented himself before her. You are thrice welcome, she said in greeting. You give me some word of my runaway lover, of his health and state of happiness. Gladly, the friend replied. I saw him only a fortnight ago. He has not changed greatly. He speaks of you often. Indeed, madame, he said to me that he could never forget you, that your hands. Yes, said Milady, defy description are beyond all human praise. The friend concluded. After some years, Milady died. At the end, she said to her surgeon, Doctor, when life has passed out of my poor body, you must open and read this letter that I now give you. You must obey the instructions you will find therein. Should you comply, one of my servants will pay you a hundred thousand francs. Should you fail, you may follow me to the grave within a week. When Milady was dead, the surgeon opened her letter and read it, and smiled grimly. It is a hideous thing to require, but I must obey. A hundred thousand francs is a very great sum of money. I shall need such a sum for several matters. For several hours he worked over Milady's pale body. A few days later, her faithless lover received a package by messenger. A card attached read, I can never forget. He opened the package quickly, and his friends found him later screaming hysterically. Everyone admired Milady's hands. End of section 17、section、eighteen of the Thrill Book, Volume One, Number Six. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ben Tucker. Thrill Book, Volume One, Number Six. From Over the Border. By Grea Lespina. Help! Help! Roused suddenly from a sound sleep, Mr. Benham sat up in bed, half awake, awaiting with tense nerves that repetition of the cry, which would prove it a reality, not an intensely vivid dream voice. Ah, there it was again. An unutterable awe thrilled him, so terrible was the note of horror and agony in the voice. Help! Ah! God! Jerked out in a kind of smothered gasp. The words died away, leaving an indescribably dreadful silence that was heavy with intangible premonitions of evil. Brought awake by this time, the startled old bachelor sprang out of bed, flooded the room with light, and reached for his dressing gown. In a moment he had slipped it on and thrust his feet into a pair of slippers. Unless he was vastly mistaken, that agonized midnight cry for assistance came from the apartment of the Orville Rotmans, 
across the corridor from his rooms, and it was borne in upon him that it was the Mrs. Rodman's voice he had heard, for although he was not personally acquainted with the lady, he had often heard her voice, which was an exceptionally sweet and well-modulated one. Thirty seconds could not have elapsed before he was knocking at the door of the Rodman's apartment, his heart almost stopping under the weight of the ominous silence that reigned. He had almost persuaded himself that she had called out in the throes of a nightmare when he heard a suffocated moan that fell weak and stifled upon his straining ears. What was happening behind those closed doors? His alarm and apprehension grew until he could bear the suspense no longer. From loud raps he began to pound with bare fists upon the door. Then he grasped the knob, twisting and pulling at it, as he strove to open the door which appeared to be securely locked. No response came from within. That ghastly silence still bore down upon him, heavy with midnight terror. He was on the point of seeking other help when something happened. The key grated in the lock. The door swung open slowly as if under the impetus of a gust of icy air that swept out upon him with almost physical force and tangibility, pushing him to one side as though he had been a featherweight. As it enveloped him with its frosty chill, he found himself shivering with what was more than physical cold. He experienced for a moment the uncanny sensation as of a malevolent presence that laughed at him evilly as he shrank before its unseen power. Terrible as was his momentary sensation, the stress of emotion in that cry he had heard a few seconds previous drew him across the threshold. He touched the switch which he knew was located beside the door, in a position analogous to the switch in his own apartment, flooding the room and adjoining corridor with a blaze of light. An icy chill entirely out of place on such a mild autumn night lingered in the still midnight air. Benham looked up and down the corridor. There was no one in sight, and as no one had passed him, he entered the room, confident of meeting one of the Rodmans or their maid, for one of the three must have opened the door to him. To his bewilderment, the room was entirely empty. Upon the strangeness of this, he did not ponder much at the moment, although he was to remember it afterward. The cry he had heard was sufficient warranty for him to make all possible haste. The door of the bedroom, which adjoined the room he had entered, was closed. The kindly intruder hesitated but a moment, tapped lightly, then entered, touching the electric switch as he crossed the threshold. For a moment he was completely staggered. He had expected to meet someone in this room, but there appeared to be no one in the apartment. To be sure, there were signs of recent, very recent, occupancy. The trailing silk and filmy laces of a delicate negligee half covered a chaise lounge, and upon the chiffonnier, Benham's quick scrutiny observed a discarded collar and tie, presumably removed by young Rodman, whose other garments were neatly disposed on a chair beside a great wardrobe opposite the door Benham had just entered. The bachelor could have sworn there was no human being in the room, and against this he had to put the reality of the agonized cries he had heard in Clara Rodman's peculiarly sweet, penetrating tones. He looked about, stupefied, to see nothing but the dresser, a chiffonnier, tables, chairs, the wardrobe. Positively, there was something uncanny about it. As he advanced into the middle of the room, the great mirror in the wardrobe reflected his disheveled figure from head to foot. He could not help seeing it, although he did not want to look at it. To observe oneself advancing to meet one at midnight just after receiving a severe shock to one's nerves is a far cry from reassuring sight, he discovered. But he felt his eyes drawn toward the mirror with a magnetic attraction that he afterward realized was strangely uncanny. And then, unexpectedly, from within the depths of the glass started up a figure. Mr. Benham felt cold perspiration starting out over his entire body at the shock of it. The face that regarded him was a man's face, with deep-set eyes holding such a smile of triumphant malice that the bachelor gave audible expression to his own astonishment with a loud, ugh, as he whirled on his heel to encounter the individual who was glaring over his shoulder. He turned, and then he stood rooted to the spot, his mouth wide open, his eyes staring. He was alone in the room as before. No one stood behind him or to either side of him. He sprang to the door, but there was no one in the next room. Then he realized that the mirror was not in a position to reflect anyone who stood in the doorway. He turned again to the glass to meet only his own astounded, mystified, and apprehensive eyes. It was too much for Mr. Benham. He started for the door, and would have left the uncanny mystery to solve itself had not a muffled, smothered sound as of faint, futile struggling near at hand met his ear. Once more he looked about him, drawing a deep breath to steady his jumping nerves. 
The mirror reflected his figure innocently enough. He looked at it as if daring it to play him another such scurvy trick, when the truth penetrated his mind in a blinding flash of intuition. Horror grasped at him with numbing hands as he rushed to the rescue. The wardrobe was a fraud. The mirror was the front panel of a handsome but treacherous folding bed, and the bed was closed, and within it, his thoughts failed to operate further. He began to pull and tug with frantic haste at the terrible piece of furniture, his momentary uncanny weird impression thrust to one side by his realization of the terrible truth and the necessity to keep a clear head. The bed had been firmly closed. As he pulled, he was rewarded by another faint sound that told him life yet lingered in one or both of the victims of the treacherous mechanism. At last he had it open, with a creaking reluctance, as of some horrid monster unwillingly disgorging its prey, it had come slowly down to the floor. The covers and the mattress had sunk to the head of the bed when it rose, almost completely cutting off the air from the unfortunate sleepers. Whether or not Benham was in time to resuscitate them, he dared not think. But he did not venture to leave them, knowing that every moment was precious. He drew the bedding anxiously from the huddled bodies lying so inert and motionless, and placed an eager ear at the breast of Clara Rodman, and then at her husband's. The woman's heart fluttered faintly, but Benham's soul was sick at the confirmation of his misgivings with respect to young Rodman. The poor young fellow was beyond mortal assistance. Memories of a treatise on artificial breathing came dimly to the rescuer's mind as he applied himself actively to restoring the beautiful young woman who lay there so pale and lovely in her intimate disarray, and his exertions were amply rewarded by a sigh which breathed from her parted lips with weak plaintiveness. He redoubled his efforts. Presently the long curving lashes lifted languidly, and her great dark eyes looked into Benham's at first with recognition. As consciousness returned, a burning blush spread over her face at the realization that it was a man, and a strange man at that, who was bending solicitously over her. With a sudden access of nervous strength, she drew the disturbed coverings about her, the while her melancholy gaze questioned Benham's with a dread beyond description. "'Who are you?' she murmured weakly. "'What are you doing here? What has happened?' "'I'm Jasper Benham, your neighbor. I heard you call for help, found you shut up in this folding bed. "'Don't look,' he cried out with a futile warning as she stirred, pricked by sudden misgivings to look for her husband. She disregarded his command. Weakly she turned to see the lifeless form of her husband. Her eyes, wild with desperate fear, she reached out, caught that limp arm, pulled at it anxiously. "'Orville, Orville, speak to me! Speak to your Clara! Oh, he does not reply, he is deaf to my voice! God have pity, then he is dead!' She fell back in merciful unconsciousness. Benham picked up her slender body and carried it to the chaise lounge, throwing the negligee over it. He dared not leave her in that treacherous bed while he went to rouse the maid, who, he now recalled, slept in the servants' quarters. He phoned the house superintendent, informed him of the tragedy, and was finally able to leave the apartment, leaving the young widow in the capable hands of her devoted maid. He returned to his own rooms, but found it impossible to go to bed. Every time he looked at his eminently well-behaved bedstead, it was to imagine it rearing up in the night, tossing him out upon the floor and trampling him as a trained elephant crushes a condemned criminal. The impression was so strong that he got out his pipe and determined to make himself comfortable in a Morris chair for the rest of the night. His thoughts reverted persistently to a particular incident of the night's tragic experience, that the more he pondered it, the more inexplicable it became. This was the fact of the locked door that had been opened to him so mysteriously. Benham could have sworn that the door was locked when he tried the handle, that he had heard the sound of the key in the lock before the door opened, he now recollected with perfect distinctness. It followed logically that someone had unlocked and opened the door to him, as his own hands were not on the knob at the time. He began to reflect the smallest incident, striving to overlook nothing, as even the smallest thing might serve to throw some light on what now appeared to be inexplicable. There had been no one but himself in the corridor, either before or after the opening of the door. He had glanced around the room as soon as he had crossed the threshold, pushing the door back against the wall instinctively as he observed no one in the room ahead of him. There was no possible chance that the owner of the hands which had unlocked the door could have slipped past him and into the corridor, nor could this person have had time to conceal himself in the Rodman apartment in the interim between the opening of the door and Benham's abrupt entrance. 
Benham hated to draw the only inference possible under the circumstances, but could not avoid doing so. Either the door had not been locked, and he would have staked anything that it must have opened before his blows and shakings had it not been locked, or the person who unlocked it was invisible to the human eye. This conclusion arrived at, the old bachelor sat up straight in his chair, drew a long breath, and unconsciously threw a searching look over his shoulder, as though to satisfy himself that he was quite alone. It was not a pleasant thought to entertain, the thought that the invisible might have accompanied him back to his own apartment. The paradoxical side of his action did not strike Benham at the moment. There were other phenomena to be considered that bore upon his conclusions, also strongly in favor of the supernatural. He remembered that upon the door's opening he had felt the chill breath of a deadly cold wind that had pushed upon him with almost tangible force. That there had been no good reason for a draft Benham was positive. He knew that the windows in the room he had entered were closed and the bedroom door had been closed until his hand opened it, so that the wide-open windows there could not have been the originating cause of the current of air which had been so strong that it had affected him powerfully at the time. Benham was not over-imaginative nor was he superstitious. He would have much preferred to have reasoned out the entire occurrence, uncanny as it now began to appear, on strictly material grounds. But the satisfaction was denied him. By no possible twisting of the facts could he account for the unlocking and opening of the door. And then, he laid down his pipe, for a sudden tremor shook him uncontrollably. He had remembered yet another thing which in the moment's excitement had thrust to one side mentally. Who or what was the man he had seen in the mirror looking over his shoulder with such malevolent triumph. Arriving at this point, Benham could not have slept a wink for the remainder of the night, had he been offered a million dollars for a short nap. Who was that man? He could not deny having seen the reflection, and where there is a reflection there must be a solid body to cast it. Had there, then, been a man in the Rodman apartment, an evilly disposed stranger? The expression of that face distorted with malevolence. Horrors. The mere recollection of it was disturbing. Yet, had there been a man behind him, a man so close as to have appeared actually looking over his shoulder, how was it that when Benham turned briskly on his heel there was nobody behind him? No human being could have left the room without making a sound or being seen as he fled in that instant of time between Benham's discovery of the reflection and his almost instantaneous glance behind him. Could it have been his own imagination? He denied this to himself, much as he disliked to give credence to what he had always looked upon as superstition and over-credulity. Dawn found Benham still puffing at his pipe, still pondering the strange and uncanny occurrences of the night, no nearer to a solution than when he had begun to puzzle over them. With morning arrived the coroner, who, when he learned from Mrs. Rodman of the bachelor's share in her rescue, dropped in at Benham's apartment to hear his recital. He listened to the details abstractedly until Benham diffidently mentioned the strange event of the door that had apparently been unlocked and opened to him without human intervention. "'That's odd, the door opening that way,' observed he, his forehead wrinkling. "'Are you sure that no one passed you in the hall? Are you positive the door was locked? Did you look behind it?' Benham went over his calculations of the previous night, this time orally. "'The Rodman apartment is on the fifth floor.' The coroner mused. The fire escape does not give on any room that could have been reached in that brief moment by any human being. Moreover, every window was securely fastened on the inside except those of the bedroom, which open on a deep, wide shaft. No human agency could have opened that door, he summed up reluctantly. And, as Mrs. Rodman also confirms your insistence about the doors having been locked, he shrugged his shoulders helplessly. I wonder if her first husband could have had anything to do with the tragedy, he suddenly remarked after a moment's silent thought. William Tolliver was mighty shrewd when alive, I've heard. Looks to me as though he'd lost nothing of his smartness by dying. I don't know yet just what he may have had to do in this case, but I have a strong intuition that he's mixed up in it somehow. I didn't know that Mrs. Rodman had had a previous marital experience, ejaculated Benham. Tolliver divorced her for running off with the young Rodman. Benham's interest increased. He urged the coroner to share with him whatever knowledge he might have of Clara Rodman's life, in the hope that it might throw some light on the occurrences of the past night. Agreeable to this request, the old bachelor was soon in possession of the following facts. 
At seventeen, her dying father urged upon her what appeared to him a most advantageous marriage with Tolliver, who loved her madly. His life seemed bound up in her. He spent his spare moments constructing the most charming bits of furniture for her and surrounded her with comforts, even luxuries, such as she had never known before. But one day, while she complacently accepted the passionate adoration of her elderly husband, appeared Orville Rodman, rich, young, romantic, handsome, aristocratic, all, in a word, that the elderly husband was not. Clara was flattered, then fluttered, by Rodman's attentions, and one day Tolliver, who had grown keenly suspicious, interrupted an interview that set his head whirling and almost stopped the beating of his heart. He left the room without a single word, a single glance backward that would have shown the rash young couple what his sentiments might be. Clara was terrified, knowing her husband to be a man of fierce, implacable nature. She yielded at once to the pleadings which up to this time she had resisted, and fled with Rodman. Tolliver discovered them after several months, and offered to divorce his erring wife upon one condition. She and young Rodman must swear on a Bible to accept and use the wedding gift he would make them. It was assuredly a strange and unheard-of proposition. Clara, womanlike, was anxious to regain, as far as possible, the social position she had recklessly risked. In order then to be free to marry the man for whom she had thrown all aside, she urged upon Rodman to accept the proposition. He yielded, they took the oath, and Tolliver kept his promise. In due course of time, Clara was freed. Rodman married her at once. To do him justice, it had not been other than a serious matter with him from the beginning. He took her abroad for a couple of years. Upon their return to the apartment he had leased, they found a letter awaiting them at Rodman's solicitor's. The fatal folding bed, made by the hands of the injured husband, was at their disposal, subject to the terms of their oath. Imagine the subtle irony of the gift. The young man declared, oath or no oath, he would have none of it. The pair came perilously near their first disagreement, for Clara persisted, in spite of her shrinking, in sticking conscientiously to the agreement. Something of her former husband's powerfully passionate nature seemed to influence her in holding to her decision. Tears on her part, a shrug of the shoulders from Rodman, and the unwelcome gift was installed in their chamber. What a gift was that! What must have been the reflections of the pair who had gained their happiness over the broken heart and the violated hearthstone of another human being, as they shared that strange gift, thinking, as they surely could not resist, of the donor of the gift? William Tolliver must have amply revenged upon the despoiler of his home and happiness night after night. The two young people became more and more reserved with each other as the days and nights, equally wretched, passed. Orville began haunting his clubs again, returning at night as though drawn by a subtly powerful magnet to toss and reflect, to grind his teeth, to toss again. Clara grew melancholy and her maid often found her dissolved in tears and told about it in the servants' quarters. After the inquest, there will be more to discuss, the coroner hinted darkly. He was quite right. The inquest brought out the final act of the tragedy, and painted, strangely enough, to the interposition of Tolliver, who had been dead several days before young Rodman's death. The maid testified that Mrs. Rodman had received a letter, which the girl had not scrupled to read when she had discovered it in her mistress's bureau drawer. It was from William Tolliver, and was in a lofty but terrible strain. It warned her to prepare her soul for sudden death. It bade her tell her husband that he had but a short time left to enjoy that which he had deliberately stolen from another man. It told her to watch for the announcement of his death, as it would be an omen to her that her own would follow shortly. Within a week, newspaper announced the ex-husband's tragic death at his own hands. The maid declared that after the receipt of this news, the pair acted like people from whose shoulders a great weight had been lifted. They toasted each other at dinner, laughing. She heard them discussing the discardal of the dead man's unwelcome gift. Orville then asked his wife if she did not consider herself absolved of her promise now that he was dead. She replied that she feared him more dead than alive. Then she had burst out sobbing, crying, Orville, Orville, swear that you do not regret your love for me. Tell me that it has compensated for everything. Mr. Rodman, said the girl, had soothed his wife with caresses. It was nearly eleven that night before she, the maid, had been dismissed, and she slept soundly until wakened by Mr. Benham after the tragedy. It was impossible to question Mrs. Rodman. 
The unhappy young widow was in such a hysterical condition that her personal physician refused point-blank to answer for the consequences if she were questioned by the coroner at that time. Benham discussed the subject thoughtfully with the coroner that afternoon in his own apartment. The man declared that, in his opinion, all the suspicion pointed at the first husband, although, of course, the verdict must be death by accident. "'I wonder if we cannot take a look at that bed,' inquired the bachelor musingly. Mrs. Rodman is in a private hospital, and the maid is in charge of the apartment. I have a theory that I'd like to subject to proof. The two men acted on Benham's proposition, and ten minutes later had entered the dread chamber of the tragedy, shutting out the maid with her curious eyes. Benham felt strangely averse to any more witnesses than were strictly necessary. Together he and the coroner went over the bed inch by inch, letting it down cautiously. It was a curious and beautiful piece of work, ingeniously conceived and handsomely executed. It appeared when closed to be a wardrobe, and the door of which was set a large full-length mirror. Perhaps it was, as a whole, a bit too heavy for a lady's boudoir, and to Benham, after the horrible accident, there seemed something almost sinister in the thing. He exchanged a mutually distrustful look with the coroner, and the two men pulled the bedding aside, exposing the springs as with a single impulse. The hinges on which the bed turned were concealed in cunningly contrived metal boxes. Benham discovered that there were two at the foot of the bed from which ran long rods that connected with those at the top. "'What on earth are these for?' he said aloud. "'The hinges of the bed must be at the top where it folds up. I believe there is something diabolical about this bed.' He called to the maid for a hammer. Then he beat and battered at the round well-oiled mechanisms until the head of the boxes screwed off, disclosing springs some kind of clockwork arrangement inside. Suddenly he began to see light. He backed off as though his hand had inadvertently come in contact with something horrible. He looked at the coroner, who stared back in dawning comprehension of something unutterably unbelievable. Mutually impelled by the same thought, they destroyed the mechanism and replaced the metal cap, laid the bedding in place, and pushed the terrible instrument of a dead man's vengeance up into place again. And then the bachelor gave a sharp exclamation. "'Come here. Stand where I am standing,' he directed. The coroner took his place before the mirror, starting back with an echo of Benham's cry. At the angle from which he looked, with the light striking the mirror from the side, he saw the distinct, life-sized features of a man peering at him from over his shoulder. Intuitively, although he had never seen a likeness of him, he knew that it was the face of William Tolliver, who— with compressed lips, looked at him malevolently from deep-set eyes under shaggy eyebrows, from out of the depths of the mirror. How it had been accomplished, by what trick of the glazier's art or the artisan's skill, the thing had been done. Staring with implacable hate from the mirror was the face of the man who had been so deeply wronged, the man who had so horribly revenged himself. No wonder the bed remained always with the mirror concealed. No wonder that the Rodmans nightly tossed and muttered, turning almost with loathing from the arms that had formerly been so eager to embrace. No wonder they had discharged one girl who had put the bed down in spite of prohibitive orders in the mistaken attempt to improve the appearance of the room. The dead man had avenged himself horribly. He had kept his memory fresh before the miserable pair day and night in the very privacy of their nuptial chamber with a refinement of torture that only a bitter and passionate nature could have devised. To this day Benham cannot decide whether or not the angry spirit of the wronged and embittered husband had not gone that night to gloat over the doom of those whom he had warned with sarcastic prophecy of their near impending death. Had it been he who, unseen, had left the scene of his final triumph so hastily, leaving open to Benham as he went the door of that desolate room, the bachelor shudders at his own uncertainty. But he was not surprised at hearing that Mrs. Rodman had entered a nursing sisterhood, which she had endowed with the vast properties left her by her husband's death. End of section 18。section 19 of the thrill book volume 1 number 6 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Christine Bowden. The Thrill Book, Volume 1, Number 6. Romance by Harold Hersey as Roy Le Moyne.
I passed the house and stopped, thrilled at this sign, Tross man's on wrong, words that might have been inscribed by some dead hand on a crumbling ruin of ancient France. How terrible it was to learn the words only spelt tradesmen's entrance with some of the letters missing. End of section 19. Section 20 of the Thrill Book, Volume 1, Number 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Donald Warren. The Thrill Book, Volume 1, Number 6. Section 20 by Various. Army Courts Marshal. Representative Royal C. Johnson of South Dakota made a speech in Congress recently in which he cited the following examples of sentences that court-martials have given. Representative Johnson left his family and seat in Congress to enlist as a private when the United States entered the war. He thought to the Battle of the Argonne, where he was severely wounded. These cases were quoted by him as examples of the severity with which the court-martial law was enforced in the American army. Charge, disobeyed order to go to isolation hospital and order to stand at attention. Sentence, 25 years. Charge, disobeyed order to drill. Sentence, 40 years. Reduced to dishonorable discharge and forfeiture of pay. Charge, absent without leave four days. Broke out of confinement. Sentence, life imprisonment. Charge. Disobeyed order to report for setting up exercises. Sentence, 10 years. Charge, did not remain at barracks as ordered. Sentence, 15 years. Charge, willfully disobeyed orders to go to work. Sentence, forfeiture of all pay and 10 years in prison. Charge, willfully disobeyed order to resume his work as janitor at the office of quartermaster general. Sentence, 20 years imprisonment, forfeiture of all pay. Charge, desertion, one day's absence. Sentence, 15 years. Charge, disobedience of orders. Sentence, 10 years confinement and forfeiture of pay. Charge, disobedience of orders involving two other charges of disobedience and threats to strike with an axe. Sentence, two years confinement and forfeiture of pay. Charge, sleeping at post. Sentence, 10 years confinement, forfeiture of pay. Charge, sleeping at post. Sentence, six months confinement, forfeiture of pay. Charge, sleeping at post. Sentence, two years confinement, forfeiture of pay, mitigated on review to six months. Charge, Sleeping at post, sentence, forfeiture of pay, 10 years confinement. Charge, sleeping on post, sentence, forfeiture of one half pay, six months confinement. Charge, sleeping on post, sentence, 10 years confinement, forfeiture of pay. Charge, recruit, willfully refuse to serve in the army or to wear the uniform, sentence, forfeiture of pay, 35 years confinement. Charge, refusal to wear uniform. Sentence, forfeiture of pay, three years confinement. On review, sentence suspended and soldier restored to duty. This list represents about two-thirds of the cases cited by Mr. Johnson. End of section 20. Section 21 of The Thrill Book, Volume 1, Number 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ben Tucker. Thrill Book, Volume 1, Number 6. The Rim of the World by Duffield Osborne. I have often felt that I would give a year of my life for an hour's talk with some friend that is dead and gone. I would talk about the things that troubled me at the moment and he would probably smile, uninterested, but kindly indulgent. 
Somehow I think if I could talk with one or two of the men I have known, it might be different, for I would talk with them of the past, and of things they know better than I. What good is there of my filling you fellows up with all that stuff? You're rational and civilized, and I am... Well, I'm a humble parasite of science, now. If you but had in your club my late, very good friend, Don Herrera Eusebio Vasquez, with the same dinner within him and the liquor and the smoke. Dreams! Ah, but you could have many tongues full for the asking. It was Carson's guest who spoke, a short, broadly built man, plump, you might say, with a round, boyish face and brown beard and hair. Troilo Watson Birk. I had met him half a dozen times, and the most definite impression I ever got was that if we slept under the same blanket half a hundred years, I would never know him the least bit better than I did now, which was not at all. I never even succeeded in placing his nationality, except to surmise it was at least as composite as his name. He spoke nearly all the languages I had ever heard, and a few others, but I judged he spoke none of them like a native, certainly not his English or his French or his German. He had been in about every part of the world, where nobody else had been, gone through no end of hardships and hairbreadth escapes, and lived God knows how many years. Yet his complexion was like a boy's of twenty, and he did not look as if there was a muscle in his body. Birk's eyes were his sole distinguished feature, and that because they seemed to have a curious faculty of changing their size and shape and color and pretty much everything that goes to make eyes recognizable. Sometimes they loomed big and round and vacant and dark blue. Then they were little and black and beady and vicious, and again full of dreams, and brown and soft as sealskin fur. He was, as he put it, a collecting naturalist. Beasts, living or dead, insects, fishes, minerals, plants, anything any man or body of men wanted and could pay for. And he knew, I verily believe, pretty much all that a man ought to know, perhaps more. The four of us had dined together at Carson's club. Carson, Birk, Levin, and myself, and Carson had put Birk up for two weeks and got him a room there. His eyes, while he had been speaking, were in their dreamy phase, and his words had been prompted by a question of Carson's which I had not caught. At the reply, however, I was all attention. "'Show us the beast anyhow,' said Carson. "'Incidentally, you promised to tell me about it when you had time, but of course the time clause lets you out. Is it upstairs in your room?' Birk smoked silently for a minute. Yes, it's up there, he said. I'll get it, and don't you fellows steal my drink while I'm away. His humor, at least, was purely Teutonic. What is it, Carson? I asked when Birk had gone out. Oh, nothing much, he said. Just a big moth. But there's a story about it that I've never been able to make him tell. He has definite ideas of what he wants to do, and what he doesn't, and he seldom changes his mind. Nobody else ever can. How do you know there's a story, then? queried Levin. Levin should have been a lawyer instead of a doctor of medicine, but before Carson could answer, Birk was coming toward us with a little flat box in his hand. He laid it on the table gingerly, an ordinary butterfly box about six by four, with a glass top and bottom hermetically sealed. "'You see him,' he said, and he returned his chair, puffing at his cigar to retain its dying light. Our heads were together over the box and its contents, a large moth of so dark a brown above as to seem black but for the really black shadings at the ends of the wings. Beneath, they were lighter, a smoky tint that gave them a curious transparent quality, but in appearance only. As a matter of fact, they were less so than those of most moths, for when one held the box up to the lamp, bottom toward you, they seemed no darker for the blackish color above, only smoky with vague shadows like floating clouds. It is very rare, said Birk, taking his cigar from his mouth, you see, it has not the two dull yellow marks of the Ashtoreth, and it is several shades darker. I've had many Ashtoreths, that is, many when you consider, but of this only one. I suppose it's worth a lot of money, said Carson. It is worth to a man what he will give, replied Birk. That is the only measure of things that are unique, but it is not for sale. I am myself interested. How? I asked innocently. I have a sort of impression that if I had said why, Birk would have shut up tight. Possibly the vagueness of the interrogation kept it from frightening him off. He looked at me with his eyes in their beady, vicious phase for a full minute, chewing his cigar. Then he said, You see, it was the Don Herrera of whom I spoke that gave it to me. 
He had said that he would die within the year and would want it no more. Three months was the end of him. Phthisis? asked Levin in his professional tone. No, said Birk and went on. He got the moth in southeastern Colombia, and it was not easy to get. Perhaps a little dangerous. Few white men go to that country, and fewer return. It is wild. I cannot well describe it except to say high mountains where you freeze, broad plains where you bake, forests where they breed strange fevers that kill in an hour, and many rivers that look innocent but are not so. The natives, they are Indians of the pure blood, quiet and hospitable enough if you do not offend, very dangerous if you do. And sometimes you may not know what the offense is till you feel the prick of the little poisoned arrow and never feel anything again. Then your head hangs on a tent pole for many years, perhaps centuries, carefully cured and shrunken in some way I know not. And it is dry and hard and your face is of a deep, rich, mahogany color. Don Herrera, you see, was a curious man in his mind. Not scientific, but inquiring, and these Indians, they are very superstitious and filled with strange imaginations. They are most independent, and have ever had their own kings. And when a king dies, they place him in the royal sarcophagus of some porous stone that makes it truly a sarcophagus, for it eats the flesh in a year, so that the tomb is always empty when the next king dies. It is a deep low grove, with a small gray stream running through it where the sarcophagus stands, and it was only in that grove that Don Herrera ever saw this moth. The Indians told him that the night after a king's body was laid in the sarcophagus, a moth like this one appeared, and that night after night it hovered over the queer-cut face on the lid until the stone had devoured the body. Then it was seen no more except on the anniversaries of his death and one like to it when the next king died. Naturally, they did not wish the moth to be disturbed, but Don Herrera was a man, as I have said, of a curious mind. The king, Ojiano Huato, had been dead six months when he got there, and he watched many nights this moth hovering about the queer-cut face. Then, after three months more, knowing it would soon be gone, for he had some Indian blood in his own veins and believed many strange things, he caught it and went away very quick. I met him at the theater in Havana about two years later, and saw him much for several weeks, so he gave me the moth in its box, as you see, saying he was near to die. Birk stopped speaking and smoked meditatively while we sat quiet. I think we all realized there was something more to hear, and feared to break the thread if we tried to draw it. At last his eyes grew brown and dreamy, and he began again. We all understand that my friend was part of the Indian blood. When he gave me the moth, he told me what I had given you, and a little more. He said that his servant, who was a half-breed of Panama, had always prepared his room for sleep, closing the windows and lighting the lamp a few minutes before the hour of retiring, that the mosquitoes should not be drawn into plenty. The box with the moth hung on the wall like a small picture. But on one night, when Don Herrera came to go to bed, he found this man, his servant, sitting upon the tiled floor before it. And Don Herrera looked, too, and the box was empty, and the moth gone. At first it was his thought that the fellow had stolen it, though the glass was, as ever, well sealed. But when he found the man dazed, much frightened, and unable to tell a good story, he knew it was not so, for the half-breeds of Panama are very excellent liars when there is need. Then he did not know what to think, so he went to bed, and when he arose the next morning the box hung on the wall with the moth safely fastened on it, which seemed most unexplainable, for both Don Herrera and his servant were very sure of what they had seen. Of course my friend's most curious mind thought much about this thing, and it occurred to him for some reason that he should count the days. The night when the moth had vanished was one year to the day from the night after the king's death. I think it was foolish of Don Herrera to speak much of this to his man, but he did so. And for several weeks the half-breed grew restless more and more, and at last he ran away. Don Herrera told me that he had heard of him afterward, that he was dead. It was the Don's drop of Indian blood, perhaps, that made him think of all these things, and it was his curiosity that made him resolve to sit up the moth case before him during the night that came one year later. 
I do not know quite what he expected or why, and he too was very vague when he came to this part of his story. Only I know he sat and watched the empty box for much of the night, and that the moth was there again at sunrise. So he gave me the box with the moth in it, as you see, saying that he would die, which he so did. Odd, ejaculated Carson. Levin spoke professionally. Yes, it looks like a pretty well-defined case of auto-suggestion. Such things are not at all uncommon among the dark races. I take it both Signor Vasquez and his servant knew the details of the Indian superstition, and that they had incurred some penalty. I do not so understand, said Birk. I could get nothing definite from Don Herrera more than I have told you, and I cannot think that even his curiosity would have led him to face death for it knowingly. What do you call it, then? asked Levin. Birk shrugged his shoulders. I call it nothing, only I should know enough to know that I know very little. How long ago was all this? I put in. About six years, a little more. And you have never felt inclined to sit up with your moth on the anniversary? No, I have never felt so curious as that. Then we were all silent for a while and smoked. At last Carson spoke. Do you know this mysterious date of King What's-His-Name's exit? He asked lightly. Surely, replied Birk. Ohiano Watto died just eight years ago, lacking one day. Then the spooky occasion is actually tomorrow night? Birk nodded. Good, cried Carson. I say we all sit up with your moth and put one more superstition asleep. Levin smiled. Doesn't it seem a rather foolish performance for grown white men? He suggested. Not at all, persisted Carson. Unless we're fellows of the know-it-all type, I've always yearned to find a real haunted house, and this strikes me as a pretty close to it. I looked at Beer. Well, I said. He spoke slowly with his eyes fixed on his shoe tips. You are very welcome to the loan of the moth. Levin watched him quizzically. But you'd rather not lend your presence as well? He queried. Why, you see, said Birk, I have an engagement tomorrow, one that takes me from town. I shall not return till the day following, but I repeat you are welcome to the moth, if you wish him. Very good, said Carson. I'd like to have you with us, for hanged if I don't think you're superstitious about it yourself. And when a man feels that way, not even the oaths of sane friends will knock it out of him. I am very sorry that it is impossible, said Birk. Then he paused and seemed to hesitate. I watched what I took to be a struggle between influences that stirred him to keep silent or to say more, but silence won out. You are welcome to the loan of the moth, he repeated. Much obliged, said Carson. Am I to sit up with the thing alone, then? He looked at Levin and me, and Levin answered in a rather indulgent tone. I suppose we might make a night of it with you, if you'll stock up with enough stuff and cigars to make it worthwhile. A cold bite wouldn't go bad either, say along midnight. I'm telling this story as straight as I can, and perhaps I ought to say that if Levin had not happened to include me in his acceptance, well, I don't know just what position I might have taken. I never held myself to be a superstitious man, but somehow Birk always affected me strongly. I did not like or trust him especially, but I had a sneaking moral certainty that were we thrown together much, he would have dominated me in a way that was not agreeable to think of. Possibly, if I'd been left quite to myself, I too might have found an engagement. But the feeling was not strong enough to assert itself against even a tentative assumed arrangement. Therefore, the matter settled itself in its own way, which is a rather comforting thing to reflect on, and we three dined together at the club on the next evening. Dined very well, and then adjourned to Carson's apartment, with the glass case wrapped in cotton batting in his big overcoat pocket. Later it was comfortably propped up on a little table easel, with a lamp behind it, and a most pleasing array of bottles and stamped boxes round about. If further comfort were needed, we could hear Carson's man at work in the pantry. He made excellent mayonnaise, did Carson's man, and weirdly sedative rabbits, wherefore we had no misgivings as to the material side of the night. As for the immaterial, our attitudes seemed less at one. You can't always judge from a man's action at such a time just what he really feels. 
especially a man of the Middle East, where the habit sets against shows of emotion, and where we often speak flippantly about the things that hit us hardest. Therefore, I don't know for sure, but as far as appearances went, Carson took the affair as a big joke on its face, with any sort of fool possibility underneath, while Levin sat and laughed, the acme of cynical indulgence. My own feeling I can state more definitely, and I am frank to say that it was uncomfortable. I think that temperamentally, perhaps, I was less superstitious than Carson, and more so than Levin. But apart from any belief or anticipation, I was conscious of what some people call nerves, and others a premonition, and to which whatever you choose to call it goes pretty far toward destroying all real enjoyment of the things of life. So, as we sat, smoking, sipping, and talking, now in a desultory way, and again of more serious topics as they came to the surface, the hours drifted along. The supper came and was most satisfactory. We had agreed to watch the moth closely as it drew near to midnight. This was at Carson's insistence. I agreed indifferently, wishing only to humor him and see the thing through according to his mood, and Levin, as usual, laughing. But midnight came, and we watched, and nothing happened. Absolutely nothing. The minutes lengthened into tens and twenties, and Levin laughed more. Carson, on the other hand, grew irritable. I think he vaguely suspected that both of us thought he had made a fool of himself, but I at least did not. I was conscious of no especial feeling except that I was sleepy, and of a growing hope that I could go home pretty soon without breaking my agreement or offending Carson. At last Levin cut the knot. "'How much longer do you want us to stay, old man?' he asked. "'Not any longer than you want to,' snapped Carson. "'I suppose you've both eaten and drunk and smoked all you can pleasantly.' I wheeled about, following Carson's finger to the box propped up on the easel before the lamp. It was empty. Levin picked it up and examined it on all sides. Hermetically sealed as ever, it surely was. But the moth that we had all been watching time and again through the evening was as surely gone. I confess suspicion was my first impulse. But I saw it go just this moment, said Carson in an awed whisper. I saw it myself. An instant it was there, the next it wasn't. And I have had my eyes on it all the time. Curious, very curious, murmured Levin. And Columbia is west of New York. Midnight there is a little later. For an hour, perhaps, the talk drifted vaguely, suddenly cut loose as it was from all moorings of preconceived fact. There seemed to be little that Levin or Carson had to say outside the line of occasional ejaculation, while I, after one or two mild essays at tentative doubt, subsided under the weight of sheer unreceptivity. Then the silences grew longer and the smoke more dense. "'Well, are we going to sit up all night?' said Carson peevishly. Or is the experiment ended? I suppose I looked surprised, and I know I felt even more so when Levin replied, I've seen enough. Let's home and to bed. Somehow I can't seem to think straight for ten consecutive seconds. But the experiment is not finished, I protested. The thing is supposed to be back in its box in the morning when it gets tired of flitting around the King Ohiano's sarcophagus. I've never been quite able to explain the condition of dull indifference into which both Levin and Carson had lapsed, especially Levin. Perhaps it was only the combined result of considerable food and drink, too much tobacco and too little sleep. Oh, we can look at it again tomorrow, said Carson. Lock it up somewhere, supplemented Levin with a yawn. Look here, said I. You fellows may have lost interest, though I can't for the life of me see why you should at this stage of the game. I haven't seen as much as you have, and I'm naturally disposed to keep on looking for some rational explanation. May I take this empty case home and see the thing out? Certainly, assented Carson indifferently. Good idea, said Levin. I'm too far gone, somehow, to trust my sense any more, but... And he braced determinedly for a moment. I'm perfectly sure of what we've seen, whatever the explanation may be. Well, to make a long matter short, I wrapped the box in its cotton batting again, with a last look to make sure it was still empty, slipped it in my pocket, and went home. Then I examined it again very carefully with a glass, and then, my first idea had been to sit and watch it till daybreak, but somehow a settled disinclination to do this grew in me. A sort of physical reaction, I suspect. I put the box under my pillow and went to bed. It was half after eight when I awoke, which I considered spoke well for my nerves. 
The light was streaming into my bedroom, and I felt instinctively under my pillow, and drew forth the box, undisturbed through the night. What I expected to see counts for little, even supposing I had any definite expectations. What I did see was the moth, fixed securely in its place, as when Birk had given it into our hands. This much I know. That I was not surprised. I would have been surprised at nothing. My state of mind was much like that of a traveler in some unvisited region, whose experiences there had brought him to view as a part of the world where all the natural laws that govern things elsewhere were in abeyance. Therefore, I dressed calmly and went to the club for breakfast with my fellow explorers. "'You have the moth, I suppose?' said Levin, and I took the box from my pocket and gave it to Carson. It was all as if I had borrowed the latest novel and returned it, or possibly that might have occasioned even more emotion. We ate and said little or nothing, partly, I suppose, because no one had a very clear idea of just what he wanted to say, and partly. But what's the use of theorizing? Just as we were finishing, Birk came in, and I wondered vaguely where out of town he had been, and how he had got back so early. He seemed nervous, almost agitated. I had never suspected him of nerves before. There was only one part of our experiment that apparently interested him, and that was who of us had actually seen the moth disappear or reappear. The rest he took calmly for granted, and when we told him the story of the night. He looked at Carson and Levin in a way I did not understand, almost angrily, I thought, and said little, but spoke irritably as with the irritation of a man embarrassed by the consciousness of some folly. He left us in a few minutes quite abruptly. Carson and Levin are both dead. Carson of typhoid fever five months after, and Levin of blood poisoning from an autopsy within the year. Both natural deaths enough in all conscience. But now I think you can understand why I would give a year of my life to talk with one of them for five minutes. As for Birk, he was a remarkable man. But somehow I hope we will never be in the same hemisphere together, and that I shall never hear of him again, which is more or less absurd. End of section 21《Section 22 of the Thrill Book, Volume 1, Number 6, May 15, 1919. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Nancy Beard. — The Thrill Book, Volume 1, Number 6, May 15, 1919, by Various. Alpheus Bing's Thrillhound by Roland Oliphant. Number three, the purple fear ray. There was joy in the heart of young Alpheus Bing's as he sat in his bedroom and looked at some things he had purchased that day. He was glad beyond measure at the thought of acquiring such wonderful treasure. One purchase especially pleased him immensely. "'By George, those are beauties,' he murmured intensely. "'It had been a hard day for the pen-pushing white, "'so he turned in uncommonly early that night. "'Slumber-filled shadows about him crept, "'and wrought their magic. "'The thrill-hound slept. "'A shriek, a most horrible blood-curdling yell, "'into the midst of the night-hush fell.' a woman's voice crying take it away it's killing me stop it that purple ray alpheus bings was awake in a second here perchance was a thrill upon which he'd not reckoned a swirling of bedclothes a patter of feet and alpheus bings ambled out to the street a crowd had collected a gape with its tongues out to see why the lady was yelling her lungs out she seemed an innocuous little old maid half frantic with terror and sorely afraid. So Alpheus, taking her hand, gently pressed her fingers and asked, Prithee, why so distressed? No answer forthcoming, he followed her gaze, and then held his hand to his head in amaze. In his many adventures the thrill-hound had seen all sorts of odd rays, purple, violet, green, besides spirit auras and astral vibrations, and such-like occultified manifestations. 
but never, no never, of all the things listed, had anything jolted his nerve ends as this did. For sparkling and crackling its way through the gloom, the weird purple ray came direct from his room. He thought for a minute, then gulped with delight. He'd struck a solution. It surely was right. He rushed to his bedroom, and there, straight away, he seized upon something he'd purchased that day. A down the back stair and across lots he hied to a bridge or a river that flowed deep and wide. He stood at the center, then quickly attached a piece of lead pipe to the thing he had snatched from the drawer in his bureau to make sure it sank. Then he sighed. What a hit they'd have made at the bank! It's beastly hard luck that the blamed purple ray should scare the poor woman and cut up that way. Deeply, sepulturally, Alpheus groaned, as the vividest socks that he ever had owned went down with a splashing, regurgitant quiver, forever to rest in the depths of the river. End of section 22、section、23 of the Thrill Book, Volume 1, Number 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Doreen Marcotte. The Thrill Book, Volume 1, Number 6. Soldiers and Sailors Personal Relief Section. Conducted by a former officer of the Adjutant General's Department, U.S. Army. If there is anything typical, purely so, of the American soldier, it is unselfishness. One's heart grows suddenly hot to think about it, and one remembers all the splendid things the boys do every day as a matter of course, without hope of reward, without thought of self. A certain private by the name of Treptov was killed at the crossing of the Ork, and on his mutilated body they found a notebook. In it was written, America shall win the war, therefore I will work. I will save, I will sacrifice, I will endure. I will fight cheerfully and do my utmost as if the whole struggle depended on me alone. Treptov called this my pledge. Think of this, you folks at home. Let it sink to the bottom of your hearts, because if such lofty thoughts are in the hearts of the private soldier, how glorious does our great struggle seem! To you, O grumbling citizen, this should be an eternal thought, this beautiful ideal expressed in the pitiful notebook of one lad who thought enough of his homeland to give his all. The mind is lifted to heights unknown when it comes across such splendid heroism. To the man in the army, service is the watchword. Service is only another saying for unselfishness. To give, give, give. That is the ideal of the game. And remember always that it is a game that requires all one can give, and more, too. When you see the wounded men crowded on the trains that comes over you with a rush, how much service these boys have given to us, and the life ahead would seem a pretty bleak affair without an ideal of this kind. I recall in this connection the second Liberty Loan campaign conducted at a certain post where I was stationed. There were approximately 3,000 men stationed there, and they raised $156,000. A number of boys pledged their entire pay for 10 months in advance. Think of it for a moment. I heard one of them say, Well, we are here to give. Why not give it all? Then, too, do you recall that stirring message which the AFF sent to America during the Fourth Liberty Loan Campaign? If you don't, let me put it down here so that the poor fame of these pages will help to perpetuate the glorious example of the boys over there. Here it is. If the folks back home fall short on the billions you need, Mr. President, 
call on us for the balance. We like our pay, but if we have to, we can go without it. Yours for victory, AEF. The attitude of the common soldier is something so unutterably fine that it will take a greater pen than mine to put it down upon paper so that all who read can understand. With all the realization of being called sentimental, I am willing to state unequivocally that our boys are without doubt the most unselfish lot of men who ever went forth upon a crusade. It is not their country that has been ravaged or closely endangered, but France and England. Yet they proved to be excellent soldiers, as the victories of Bois de Villou and San Milio have proven. They fought for other people's rights, and their task was one that called forth the utmost out of a manhood which they possessed. Nothing before or since has equaled that historic entry into Paris in July 1917. The whole civilized world waited breathlessly to see what that slender column of men would develop into during the oncoming months. The Germans scorned them, disbelieved in them, but inside of fourteen months we had nearly two million across the water and had organized that amazing shipment of men each month, which held us breathless. Why was all this possible? It rested upon the unselfishness of the men who engaged in the work. From the lowest to the highest it was the same. Each individual had his task, and he performed it without regard to his own feelings, his desires, or the stress of the moment. A job had to be done, and it is done. That is all there is to it. Excuses are not in order. The complaining fellow finds himself most miserably alone, and he soon learns to bend to the work like a man. He gains a vision of his duty, and like Private Treptoff, he fights and works as though the whole struggle depended upon him alone. How much sweeter and cleaner would our home lives be if we were to live like these boys do? I often wonder how the cranky person feels when he reads of men like Private Treptov. It must be quite an eye-opener. Surely there is no one on earth who could read of this lad's pledge and still remain the same. There is no shell so hard but what it would be opened by an example so stirring. A wounded sergeant of the Marines said recently, Every man who was with the Marines in that fighting over in France and who came out alive is a better man than he was before he went in. He has a broader, finer way of looking at life. He sees the world through new eyes. He may have been wounded and cut up and gassed and have suffered physically more than I care to think about. But he is a better man for all that. He has learned to think of others more than of himself. He has risen above most petty things. He has seen the suffering of a nation, and he has done his part as best he could to right a great wrong, and so he is better in every way. Better for himself, better for his people, and better for the world at large. Again, O oh ye people back home, think of this idealism from a sergeant who was wounded in battle and who may never recover. It should come home to you like a streak of fire across a dark sky. Thus it is, and it means a new country here after the war. These men are learning the hard lesson in a hard school. What they learn is going to stick. It is no superficial matter, but we tell you it is a case of brass tacks and plenty of them. The cause of the war was selfishness. The solution and victory lie in unselfishness. The President has put it correctly many times. His great idealism and lack of thought for selfish ends has made the war a tremendous crusade for the helpless little nations, for the right of the individual, 
and against the greed of a despotic nation. He has set the standard, and the world is living up to it. The last soldier in the army learns it. It is the omnipresent idea everywhere. Men might write books by the ton, preach sermons by the thousand, scribble inspiring poems, draw dramatic pictures, compose splendid music, do all these things for a hundred years for one purpose, and still not do one hundredth part of the work done in a few months by those boys at the front. A common cause, a common enemy. These are parts of the explanation. But there is no explaining the business. It just is, that's all. It is the proof of the pudding. We are awakening at last to the fact that the American dream of ability is a reality. We have not failed. That is the point. Let us not forget, however, that our success depended heavily upon the individual's sacrifice. In him there was the hope of peace, and to him was given the task of sacrificing his all to see that peace was gained speedily and effectively. The Editor Questions and Answers B.L.O. Question I am twenty-nine years of age. How much should I pay for $5,000 war risk insurance? Answer, $3.45. RT. Question. How is the government going to discharge disabled soldiers, and what are the conditions under which this may be carried out? Answer. The following circular letter sent by the Surgeon General to all Army surgeons in hospitals outlines the present government policy. It is the policy of the War Department to retain, so far as practicable, under military control, for the purpose of medical and surgical treatment, a. officers and soldiers suffering from acute diseases or acute exacerbations of chronic diseases or unhealed lesions, b. officers and soldiers suffering from communicable diseases, or who are carriers whose discharge would be a danger to the civil community. C. Officers and soldiers suffering from disabilities incurred in the line of duty which are correctable within their terms of service or enlistment. D. Officers and soldiers suffering from chronic or permanent disabilities incurred in the line of duty which are susceptible for improvement by measures for mental or physical reconstruction designed to fit them for return to their homes, for the resumption of their former vocations, or with their consent for the industrial opportunities, or the training courses provided by the Federal Board for Vocational Education. To Restore Health In the accomplishment of this policy, it is the intention to restore officers and soldiers who are held in service as provided above to health and function as fully as possible, considering the nature of their disabilities, the limitations of the military service, and the other provisions which the government has made for the care of the permanently disabled. The National Home for Disabled Volunteer Soldiers provides retreats for former soldiers who have served in time of war and are unable to maintain themselves. The Bureau of War Risk Insurance provides compensation and medical and hospital treatment for disabilities incurred in the line of duty. The Federal Board for Vocational Education provides courses in vocational training and maintenance during the same for soldiers disabled in the line of duty. End of Section 23section 24 of the thrill book volume 1 number 6 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org read by donald warren the thrill book volume 1 number 6 around the world by various around the world mcintis nearly spoils ball of the pegleg club Charlie McGintis, an old salt who made a whaler on the South Sea, 
his home back in the 80s, almost broke up the annual ball of the Peg Leg Club in Galveston, Texas. But for the presence and participation of Charlie, the dance would have been devoid of anything out of the ordinary other than the squeaking of cork limbs and the thud of the pegs when bending in rhythm to the tantalizing strains of the jazz. But Charlie was there. More than that, he insisted on dancing with his peg leg, and his peg was a stump of the type used by sailors. The peg leg club is composed strictly of members who have been so unfortunate as to lose a leg or an arm or both, and fortunate enough to have that member or those members replaced by wooden or artificial ones. The total membership of the club is 137, of which 47 are women. 100 persons were present at the dance. Attending and participating in it was George Bullen, who has two cork legs and two cork arms. Miss Martha Helling, with a cork leg and two mechanical arms, was also present. The music for the occasion was furnished by the orchestra of the club, composed of five pieces, three violins, and two guitars. Well, the ball opened with a grand march, and by the time that was over, most of the hinges in the wooden legs were thoroughly oiled and working. The real dancing had just got underway, when who should ask for admittance but Shirley McGintis. Shirley scorns cork legs and hustles nimbly about on the old-time peg which he made from a hard wood that grew on a small island in the South Sea. Shirley was welcomed. He immediately spiked his top piece, warmed his hands, and said, Hello to all the crowd, tossed a dollar to the orchestra, and then secured a partner for the next dance. The number was a one-step, and Shirley was stepping lively enough at first. Pretty soon some member of the club kicked into a stump. This happened more than once. Then the leather cap came off of the end of Shirley's stump leg, and the spikes in the end of it began to scrape the wax off the floor. In fact, he was cutting the wax like an ice saw, but he was not bothered in the least, for it was the annual occasion to forget deformities and wooden limbs and be merry. About this time, the orchestra struck up the liveliest part of the music. Shirley forgot that he was using a peg leg, and he gave his graceful partner a whirl. He brought the stump down emphatically. It stuck to the floor. Shirley realized something was wrong. He gave the wooden member a twist in efforts to pull it from the floor, but it was of no use. That stump stuck as firmly as if it was grown there. The dancers piled into and onto Shirley as he clung madly to his partner and struggled to free himself from the floor. Other dancers grabbed at each other, and more than one mechanical arm and wooden leg was disjointed from swaying bodies in the melee. Finally, the leather strap around Charlie's knee gave way. The stump was left growing in the floor, while a struggling, straining, and maddening mass of humanity and mechanical limbs piled up about it. Hooks on the end of artificial arms, slit lingerie waists, and twisted mechanical knees protruding through skirts and trouser legs. The moaning of hinges and stifled cries of ladies filled the room. Finally, things grew quiet. Shirley dragged himself to a bench along the side of the wall. The lady members of the club wanted to throw him out, but better counsel prevailed. He was a member of the club, and the accident was unavoidable. Three of the men wrenched Shirley's peg leg from the floor and pitched it to him. He silently buckled it on and then rose. With a look of disdain, he surveyed the crowd. He declared that he would never attend another dance, and the ladies swore by their hands and feet that they would never dance another step with Shirley. They demanded that he sever his connection with the organization, but he will not be compelled to do so. After things were straightened out and Shirley had gone, the dance was continued. The members of the Peg Lake Club did not find their way home until early in the morning. The Aerial Cowboys the airplane scout will replace the picturesque cowboy on the ranches of the west within a few years if inquiries received at the glen martin airplane plant in cleveland ohio are any indication ranch owners plan to use the machines to trace lost cattle and sheep scores of letters received at the plant indicate dies after taking patient to hospital after he had taken a patient to the hospital and seen that every arrangement for his welfare had been made Dr. William C. Griggs, a prominent West Philadelphia physician, fell dead from heart disease in the Misericordia Hospital. Dr. Griggs, who lived at 558 North 58th Street, was born in Portsmouth, England, 52 years ago, and came to this country when 17 years old. 
He was graduated in medicine at the College of the City of New York in 1890. Immediately after his graduation, he was sent to Bama, Burma by the Baptist Church to found a hospital and school. He stayed there 14 years and during that period made three trips to this country to study and provide new appliances to keep both school and hospital modern in every way. In 1904, he returned finally and established a practice in West Philadelphia. Famous equestrian clown risks life for a laugh. Edwin Hannaford is a clown, but unlike Marceline, Toto, Bluche, and the other famous clowns who have tried to make New Yorkers laugh, Mr. Hannaford is many other things. He is not only an acrobat, a comedian, a magician, and a dancer, to mention just a few of his accomplishments, but he is one of the greatest horsemen in the world. In fact, he was without peer as a straight rider while he was still in his teens, and today, at 27, he is the highest paid equestrian artist to employ the language of the tan bark in the business. In the performances in which he appears in his whirlwind act with his sister and brothers, with his mother's ringmaster, he is known as Poodles, for every clown has a nickname, and beside, Mr. Edwin Hannaford is much too dignified for a chap whose business it is to make people laugh. Like most equestrian artists, they are the most exclusive of circus folk and rarely marry out of their own caste. Poodles comes from a family famous on both sides for many generations in the annals of the English circus world. His skill he attributes to the unique training of his father, himself the fourth the name of Hannaford to star as an equestrian. In training his children for the profession, he taught them just one thing, to fall off the horse. Once they mastered that feat, they picked up the rest from imitation and inherited instinct for the work. Month after month, I was ordered to fall off my pony, declares Hannaford. At first, I was a mass of bruises, although I never had the slightest fear. In fact, when I could barely crawl, they used to look for me in the stables among the horses' hoofs when I disappeared for a few minutes. I always loved horses, and little by little, I got the hang of falling and rolling out of the way of the hoofs of the galloping pony. After that, my father used to blindfold me and make me fall that way, so I would rely on horseman's instinct rather than my sight for escaping danger. I got so tired of tumbling off that I used to rack my brains to invent new falls, and I finally thought up the stunt of walking off the horse, a stunt which I still use. This trick never fails of a laugh. It has baffled hundreds of riders by the apparent ease with which young Hannaford does it but no one has been able to imitate it. One minute he is tearing around the ring at breakneck pace, clinging to the horse's neck and apparently in imminent danger of breaking his own. The next he rises gracefully on the still-speeding horse, extends one foot in midair, and steps as nonchalantly to the ground as any top-hatted gallant leaving his limousine. He would risk his neck any time for a laugh, declares his mother regretfully, but the only nervous person in the ring is Mrs. Hannaford, who declares that no matter how long she lives, she'll never get used to the venturesome ways of her children. He's always thinking up some new stunt in the middle of the act and calling on his sister Lizzie to do it with him, and away they go before I can stop them. She standing on his shoulders, or he playing leapfrog over her on the horse's back. One is just as bad as the other, she laments. Hannaford is a Yorkshire man. He is a slender, quiet youth outside of the circus, dressed in clothes of it irreproachable English cut. There is nothing about him to suggest either the horseman or the clown. And yet, since he made his professional debut 22 years ago at the age of five, riding around the ring on a tiny pony beside his father, he has not missed a season in the ring. Of his initiation into the ring, he says, I shall never forget one day when the whole company of riders, about 30 altogether, was gathered in the ring at practice hour. My father brought me in and put me on the horse, and everybody laughed. I saw red for a minute, and I turned to him and said, Father, why are they laughing at me? He tried to comfort me and said, Go ahead, son. Just show them what you can do. I knew they were making fun of me, and I started the old horse up with a kick, determined to make him laugh out of the other side of their mouths. I was in five at the time, but I had spent all my life around the ring watching the older people perform, and I knew every one of their tricks. Well, that day I did better than I knew how. I rode forward and backward, 
I turned somersaults and flip-flops. In fact, I did all the stunts of that circus. And when I had finished, I stood up backward on the big horse, which was still galloping around and around the ring, and I made a very low bow to my audience with my thumb at my nose. They had all been holding their breath a minute before, fairly stunned that such a tiny roly-poly body could do what I was doing. They didn't know the black rage that was in my heart, and when they saw that gesture, a roar of laughter went up that I can hear now. I was soundly spanked for my disrespect, but it was worth it. Returns home after 27 years. After an absence of 27 years, during which his brothers believed he had died, and were just about to start proceedings in the court to have him declared legally dead, Jeremiah Sullivan has returned to the Oak Grove section of Malden and will share in an estate of $10,000 left by his father. Sullivan was identified by many Malden people, including patrolman Charles T. Costello, a playmate when they were boys. Sullivan left Malden when he was 20. Crew blames Skipper for two deaths. Hellfire Adolf Penderson, Skipper of the American Brigantine Tuaco, was locked up in the tombs recently on charges by the nine members of the crew. His two sons, A.E. and L.R. Penderson, who served as mates on the Brigantine, were also held. The crew were lodged in a Ludlow Street jail as material witnesses. The Puaco sailed from San Francisco with a cargo of lumber, April 19, 1918, bound for Cape Town, South Africa. The crew declared that the deck load of lumber was piled 15 feet above the rail and that when the voyage ended, August 27th, two of the crew were missing. Their shipmates alleged they jumped overboard and were drowned because of the brutality of the officers. Penderson and his sons, the sailors said, had a favorite trick of ordering one man to go aft. They would then jump on him, handcuff him, and belabor him with knotted towels and a club. The men were forced to obey orders at the point of an automatic pistol. The American consul at Cape Town took the testimony of the crew and ordered them to return to New York for trial. The 11 men reached New York on a transport cruiser Rochester, which brought over 350 troops and they were arrested by the Marine Division of the Police Department by order of Assistant United States District Attorney Ben Matthews. The United States Commissioner Hickok, before whom the skipper, his sons, and crew were brought, fixed bail for Captain Penderson at $25,000 to answer the charge of violating the Seamen's Act by administering corporal punishment. The sons were similarly charged and held in $5,000 each. In default of bail, the three went to the tombs. Judge Hand in the United States District Court ordered the nine members of the crew to Ludlow Street Jail for the night when he learned they could not supply bail of $1,000 each. The men who are said to have jumped overboard to escape persecution were John Henry Stewart, the cook, and Seaman Axtell Hansen. The charge of murder that the crew prefers against the skipper is based on their allegation that after Hansen jumped overboard, he repented and seizing a line that was trailing over the stern, begged to be taken back aboard. The crew declare that the captain refused to permit him to be taken back. Captain Pedersen stated that the men became mutinous soon after leaving port and were difficult to control. He declared that when a man fell overboard, the crew refused to lower and man a boat to pick him up. The long trip over four months was made by way of Cape Horn. On the arrival at Cape Town, the crew lodged a complaint with the American consul with the result that captain, mates, and crew were sent to Brest and put aboard the Rochester. Learn to speak with new tongue. Private Horace B. Van Everen of A Company, 101st Engineers, winner of a French cross of war, is learning to talk with a new tongue. A piece of his tongue was shot away while in action. He was throwing a pontoon across the stream near the Chemin de Dames in the big drive when a shell struck that killed three of his party, wounding several, including himself. A piece of shrapnel passed through his cheek, tearing into his tongue, while other pieces struck into other parts of his body. A French surgeon pieced a tongue together so skillfully that he was given a decoration in recognition of his feet. After the tongue healed, Van Everen found he could not control it like the other one and had a terrific struggle with his enunciation. He is now able to make himself understood clearly and improve steadily. Van Everen is recuperating in base hospital number 10 
at Parker Hill, Boston. Ex-Army Captain, now humble, Gob. From the silver bars of an Army Captain to the red stripe of a third-class fireman. Sounds strange, doesn't it? Nevertheless, Stanley Satterwhite of Company 668, 8th Regiment, strolled about Camp Farragut, gravely returning the respectful salutes rendered him by passing sailors. Today he is wearing a gobs uniform and is carrying out orders of a Navy Company commander. Captain Satterwhite, or Fireman Satterwhite, as he should now be called, has just completed a four-year enlistment in the regular army. He enlisted in the regulars, United States Infantry, on May 16, 1914, at his hometown, Louisville, Kentucky, going in as a private. Satterwhite was not a leatherneck long, being soon raised to a corporalship. A little later, he was made a sergeant, and two months after Uncle Sam's entry into the World War, he was given a commission as second lieutenant. He was raised to first lieutenant January 15, 1918, and was given the rank of captain August 23, 1918. The former captain has seen service in the Hawaiian Islands, having been in command of an army post near Honolulu for about a year. He has also served on the Mexican border, having commanded a company of infantry there from August 29th until the date of his release, December 17, 1918, when he was honorably discharged from the army. Asked his reasons for choosing a billet as a common sailor in a preference to a gold braid job in the army, Fireman Satterwhite stated, it had always been one of his ambitions to sail the ocean on a United States dreadnought. Prior to the signing up with the Army, he had attempted to join the Navy, but was rejected on physical grounds. It had been my intention to re-enlist in the Army upon the completion of my first enlistment there, he continued, but at about the time I received my discharge, I read a statement by Secretary of the Navy Daniels calling attention to the Navy's need for men. My old desire to wear the uniform of blue came over me, and I made up my mind to sign up in the Navy. I picked the fireman branch because I wanted to be in with real fighting men, and also I believe I can advance myself rapidly in that part of the service. The tall Kentuckian is not at all disconcerted by the prospects of experience the rigors of life as a sailor. He is quite ready to swab decks, serve on mess, do messenger dirty, heave coal, and shovel snow. While in the Army, Satterwhite won a sharpshooter medal for excellent marksmanship, and this, together with the fact that he was a railroad fireman at one time in his varied career, points him out as a valuable man for Uncle Sam's Navy. U.S. Discharge Medal The honorable discharge emblem to be issued by the War Department to soldiers leaving the Army will be a bronze lapel button somewhat similar to that of the G.A.R., a design has been selected from 15 models submitted by American artists and sculptures. It is announced. Spirit Saved Dead Girl Some 20 years ago, a group of fraternity men met at an old grad's reunion in an eastern college. They gathered in a very familiar old room that evening, and one of their numbers was moved to tell the following story. You fellows know, of course, he said, that I married soon after leaving college. Ours was a love match, if ever there was one. We were happy for years, and then my wife died. My prayers and the skill of the doctors I brought to her availed nothing. Through the funeral I sat as completely detached as if I too were dead. I endured the rest of the day in a sort of stupor. When I retired and fell into an uneasy sleep, my wife came back to me. The sound of her voice awoke me, and then she was gone. I slept again, and again she called. Come to me. Come to me. I am dying, she cried. You are dead, my dearest, I heard myself saying. No, no, she pleaded. Come to me. So vivid was the impression that I had actually heard my dead wife's voice that I arose and dressed. I got my physician out of bed, and together we went to the cemetery and opened the grave. My wife's body had not been embalmed, now a faint flush had come into her cheeks. Her flesh was warming. The next day she was in our home. She is living today a healthy, normal woman. Spooks testify. The spirits invaded Judge Frank R. Graham's courtroom in New York one day, 
recently in the trial of Mrs. Martha Wurtz, 923 Hudson Avenue, who was arrested by policewoman Agnes Walsh and Teresa Johnson on a charge of telling fortunes. Mrs. Wurtz's defense was that she is an ordained spiritualist. To prove this, attorney Benjamin Burr placed on the stand Mrs. Janet Arion, president of the Arion Aid and Benevolent Society. Seated in the witness chair, Mrs. Arion, at the direction of Judge Graham, proceeded to hold a session with the spirits. As Mrs. Arion began with 150 women spiritualists in the courtroom, joined in the demonstration. Mrs. Arion closed her eyes and arising said, Let everybody stand. Spiritualists and spectators obeyed. Mrs. Arion then said a prayer. Close the doors, commanded Mrs. Arion. The bailiffs complied. Put your heels together. Hundreds of heels clicked. Take your hands out of your muffs. Take off your gloves. Loosen your wraps and place your hands on your hips. The commands were complied with promptly while Judge Graham looked on. Just as Mrs. Arion concluded her orders, Assistant City Prosecutor A. Aarons started to enter the judge's chambers. I see the city prosecutor is leaving the room, she said. He is a person of such magnetic influence that he could be of much assistance if he would remain. When someone in the back of the courtroom laughed, Mrs. Arion said sharply, There must be no laughing. As the laughing subsided, Mrs. Arion said, Cast all material doubts from your minds. Then Mrs. Arion, with hands clasped, faced Judge Graham and said, Judge Graham, I see above your head a beautiful wreath in which there are five white roses. Those roses typify five spirits which are attendant in your everyday life. They are the spirits of five persons who have meant much to you and who have gone into the larger life. Pausing for an instant, Mrs. Arion continued, And Judge Graham, there is something in what I now see. I see a little old white-haired man and a sweet little old woman with a black bonnet standing near you. You know who they are, Judge. I do not. And Judge said to witness, There's a yellow flower in the wreath that I see above your head. That means that some person in your family is ill. After Mrs. Arion had concluded, Judge Graham thanked her for the demonstration, then said that in his opinion, Mrs. Wurtz was guilty of fortune-telling and that he would impose a fine of $100. Flying Firebox Strikes Woman Mrs. Agnes Maloney 27 years old, of number 12 West 88th Street, New York, is reported to be dying as a result of a fractured skull suffered when she was struck in the head by a firebox, which was ripped from an electric pole when an automobile crashed into it at 88th Street and Amsterdam Avenue. August Flack, 69 years old, who was run down by the machine, is also in the hospital in a less serious condition although he suffered a fractured rib and contusions to the head. Reginald Van Russel, a schoolboy, 16 years old, was cut by flying glass, but refused medical aid and went home. John Durkin, driver of the automobile, was locked up on a charge of felonious assault and reckless driving. Five dead in lynching riot. Five persons were killed, more than 20 were known to be injured, and several probably were fatally hurt when a mob numbering several thousand stormed the city jail at Winston-Salem, North Carolina, in an attempt to lynch a Negro prisoner accused of attacking Mrs. J.E. Childress and shooting her husband and Sheriff Flint. Among the injured are two members of the reserve militia called out when the trouble started. The mob, which formed in the afternoon, succeeded in seriously wounding the Negro. A white prisoner named Trag was hit by a stray bullet. The police succeeded in driving the crowd away, but by nightfall, the mob gathered again. When the fire department turned the hose on the crowd, more shots were fired. End of section 24. Section 25 of The Thrill Book, Volume 1, Number 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ben Tucker. The Thrill Book, Volume 1, Number 6. How About It? by Harold Hersey, Editor. Are you registering the idea of the Thrill Book? 
Are you beginning to see how big our idea was when we started the magazine? If you have been a regular reader, you couldn't help but see how we have been steadily climbing with each issue into a secure place on our readers' library tables. It has not been the mere result of a happy idea, but rather the fact that it was THE idea. To conceive a thing and to do it are entirely distinct and separate matters, as we all know to our own sorrow. We confess that, although we knew the thrill book was needed, we had no idea that it was an absolute necessity. We had heard people say that it was difficult to find the kind of story in current magazines that really held one's interest. It was one of the causes that led us to establish this magazine. We knew that 80% of the tales that appear are tiresome and hardly worth reading. We realized that the same percentage of readers were demanding that this condition of affairs change. What literally swept us off our feet was the wholehearted reception accorded us from the very start when we announced that, at last, a periodical was coming forth with the practical theory that the good story did exist and only needed discovery and publication. The trouble was that previously fiction had fallen into a rut. It moved in well-oiled grooves. It was often finely done. It possessed plots of no mean texture. But it lacked in vitality. The spinal column of American fiction was beginning to suffer from a peculiar disease that might be termed laziness. The poor patient could hardly hold his head up. Stories started well, ended poorly, failing utterly to hold our interest. What was the reason? Many things contributed to this state of affairs, the most important being the set condition of mind of those who conducted the ordinary humdrum carrier of fiction. They imagined foolishly that the American reader was humdrum also. It is almost unbelievable that such an opinion could exist. Naturally, it ended in a static muddle, a kind of stagnant pool. The American loves pep. He eats it up. He likes to see and meet people with energy and imagination. That is one of the reasons why we succeeded so well over there in the Great War. It has contributed largely to the astounding place which the United States now occupies as a leader of the world's thought. In the same way the American likes to read stories with ideas and real punch, the harder you hit, the better he feels. The thrill book stands for just such an ideal. We are proud to admit that we are an American institution already. Just as Edgar Allan Poe showed sleepy old Europe that a real short story could be written, so are we going to prove that a magazine publishing vital, original fiction can prosper. We have found to our satisfaction that it can do so as easily as rolling off a log, just as long as we continue our policy of giving the reader what he wants. Look over the issues that have appeared, and buy each new one as it comes out. And we are sure you will agree with us that, at last, you can find square-rigged, red-blood, honestly absorbing stories of a kind that have been jettisoned by other magazines. The Editor End of section 25. End of the Thrill Book, Volume 1, Number 6.